It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therott is here back from two, not one, but two trips to Vegas in the last week. He'll explain that and why he bought a MacBook Air. There is a good reason. It's coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thurot, episode 205, recorded April 21st, 2011. Maybe it's the clown nose. Windows Weekly is brought to you by. Go to Assist Express. If you're an IT or software consultant, up your competitive edge and grow your business with Go to Assist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. And by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look more professional. Get started with a free package at FreshBooks.com. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers all your Windows needs in great and thorough detail. Thanks to this feller here, Mr. Paul Thorat, the editor-in-chief of the Super Site for Windows. It was his efforts there for the last decade that nominated him to this august role. Yikes. As the man in charge of Windows Weekly. The arbiter, as the we say. Arbiter. Little did I know, he's also a news editor for Windows IT Pro, an analyst for Penton Media, and the author of many fine books, including Windows, Phone, Secrets. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the interlocutor, Paul Therott. The interlocutor? Yeah. Hmm. No, Sounds actually, like a British thing. What I'm is the that? interlocutor. No, the exchequer. What's that the term? Chancellor of the exchequer. Exchequer. That man that's, in charge of all the money. That's what I would like to be. The interlocutor, at least as I know it, is the guy in charge of a minstrel show. Oh, well, that's actually maybe that's more accurate for me. So, Although I'd be the guy at the bottom of the minstrel show. <laughs> it's, it, is a, it is basically another wor word for master of ceremonies. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, there yeah. you go. Uh, the master of ceremonies of a minstrel show or in politics... And I think this may be more germane, someone who informally explains the views of a government, or in your oh. case, the views Microsoft, of Microsoft. Which is much like a government. Yes. Yeah. And larger actually, than many. Are, the parallels are, are many there, actually, I would say. Or it's an order of a Scottish court, but I don't think we'll use that meaning. Yeah. Uh, you have to say interlocutor. Well, that's a long way of saying I agree with you, so... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Paul. Good to see you. You too. Uh, it's been a week, you know. I, it, it's been a week, and yet, uh, and yet I traveled to Vegas last week and saw you. Came home for a couple of days, and then traveled to Vegas again. And what? I just got back. Yeah. Are you mad, sir? Did you uh, play in the World Series of Poker? No. Did no, you? I don't gamble. What did you do this second trip? Uh, this past trip was my company had their own trade show, oh. or trade shows, I guess, a set of shows. Uh, we host the connection shows a couple times a year now, we, and we have some new ones around mobile development, and we also had a cloud connection show for cloud computing, and I think I would remember the third one. Uh, it's okay. And it's another good. one. <laughs> Dev when you say your company, you're talking about Penton? No, I'm sorry, virtualization connections. Virtualization. Yes. You're talking about Penton Media? Yes. Yes. Do you own Penton Media? <laughs> no, I am owned by Penton Media. I'm a kept man. <laughs> he owes his soul to the company store. Yes, I do. So um, why just you know why didn't you just stay in Vegas? That was one of the options. So my kids' vacation week is this oh. week, and one of the things my wife and I looked at was whether it made sense bring them to stay and have them come to Vegas. You know, and if I think if the shows have been a little different, we might have. I was hoping to have the kids come between the shows. Uh. But it didn't work out, so I ended. Up, I just, it just made more sense to go home. I think there's nothing a child loves more than hanging out in the lobby when mom and dad uh, spend the rent money uh, playing. Well, so we don't gamble. But honestly, I, walking around Vegas, it occurs to me my kids would love this place because all they would have to do is hang out at the pool at the Bellagio. And right. They'd have the greatest experience of their lives. So it's or maybe funny the one at Mandalay Bay that has the wave pool thing. And briefly, Vegas flirted with the idea of being a family destination. 
And yeah. then I realized it turned off the gamblers. And <laughs> I, I think the be true to yourself mantra is what you know came hold there so it was it was an interesting idea but yeah they, that's it was they changed that right right when they announced the new <laughs> slogan of vegas what happens in vegas stays in vegas yeah it was kind of yeah. a kind of a signal it was a rocket that they set up in the sky saying whatever you do don't bring the family <laughs> exactly so i think you i think you made the right choice although i have to say uh I think, I think kids they would have enjoyed have it, you know, but we could have gone to the uh, Hoover Dam and... Yeah, there's lots to do. Whatever, but... I right. want to take Henry to uh, Vegas and uh, go to that shooting range where you can fire uh, automatic weapons. Uh, yes, heavily advertised uh, around town. You I've mean, done this. You know, I, I did this in uh, Phoenix years and years ago, and I remember... This is going to be horribly on PC, but uh, we fired various guns. One of them was a an AK-47 that had a wooden... I want to say it had a wooden wow. stock, a wooden grip. Sure. Or whatever. I'm not surprised, yeah. The guy said, uh, he said, this killed many people in the Arab-Israeli war. Oh, jeez. And I was and it, like... It wasn't lovely. wielded by no Israelis either, I could no, tell you No, this was one of those things I was afraid it was going to splinter in my hands and, you know, cause some accidents. But, Satan? Yeah. I'm not so, uh, wow. That's a, what's a Kalishnikov? Is that what they call it? No, it was an AK-47. It was a... Oh, that's different. Okay. Yeah. I thought they were the same. There's a book about that gun on audible.com. Yeah, uh, right, right. The most uh, successful gun in history, or yeah, something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But then enough of enough of enough of this. I prefer to keep my gun play to Call of Duty, sir. We, yeah. Well, that's true. Now, here's a question: Did it help you yeah. in? Uh... No, but you know, actually, do you know what Call of Duty did help? This is a couple of years ago when we first did this. But my son, for his birthday now, for three years running, we've gone and done paintball. Oh, fun! You know, where, you, where you go out in the woods. Fun. And the very first time we did it, um, you know, he, of course, he would have been, let's say, 10 years old or maybe, I guess, 11 years old at the time. And uh, him and his dopey little friends all kind of bumped into each other at the second we started. And I thought, OK, I'm going to distance myself from these clowns, <laughs> uh, you know, because they were just little victims, you know, waiting to happen. But the one of the games was in this ghost town thing. And it's a it's a full town they set up. And, you, and my son and I actually worked our way down the hall. So we went around the entire circumference of the area. And we wiped out the entire other team, just the two of us. And it was very Call of Duty-esque. <laughs> and it was one of those things where we would cover each other and went down the hall. So it was kind of one of those great father-son moments in a way. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was literally, uh, it was kind of like a Call of Duty training moment, you know. <laughs> it, was pretty, it was pretty good. See, you know, Dvorak always said that his kids were better drivers when they took the driver's exam for all of the driving games. <laughs> for all the driving games. So it's good. I'm not sure, I'm not sure uh, Mario Kart is necessarily <laughs> training for driving, but actually around Boston area it is. <laughs> it's, based on it's very similar to Boston <laughs> driving. Yeah. Well, it does, I mean, it makes sense. The gen genesis of, these, uh, of all of these games were, were simulators. Uh, sure. So sure. why not? Well, that's actually, I tried to explain to my son one time about the driving games. You know, the reason I don't care about these games is I, I own a car, you know. I mean, I think the, exactly. escapism, the, escape, <laughs> the escapism of the Call of Duty stuff is I'm never going to do this in real life. Yeah, or exactly. if, if I ever have to, something has gone horribly wrong in this world. So last thing I want to do is drive one yeah. minute more than I have to. Yeah, I think I'll get stuck in traffic on the way home for 90 minutes and then come home and play a, a, a driving game. Yeah. You know? Enough time no. behind the wheel. Thank you. Not going to happen. Um, here's a shocker. Yeah. I hear you bought a MacBook Air since I've seen you last. It's true. I did. I mean, I, I love my MacBook Air. I recommend it highly. It's a great computer. Yeah, but yeah, I, just, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't expect Mr. Windows Weekly to buy one. Right. Um, well, but I'm, I'm installing Windows on it. Oh, okay. So well, that makes it all right. The, the rationale here, and I'll write up an article about this, uh, or I'll, I should say, I should, I'll have an article done. I've already written it, um, you know, sometime after we put, uh, record this. But the, the gist of it is, you know, I travel a lot. And, and even on semi-light machines, like a four-pound machine, five-pound machine, something like that, you know, when you have to cart that thing around, it really wears on you. And I'm a big guy, but, I mean, you put, throw that strap over your shoulder... I, I probably have a permanent, you know, Grand Canyon style groove in my shoulder from the various laptops I've had to carry around, you know. And and I've been looking at laptops for a long time and thinking about buying a high end ThinkPad that would be very expensive and, and pretty light, not as light as a MacBook Air. But and and I, I really prefer ThinkPads for many reasons. You know, the keyboard is fantastic, um, best of breed. I like the pointer that the ThinkPad uses because it's very precise. And 
um, and, and some other things. I mean, they offer uh, non-glossy screens and so forth. But, you know, the thing about the MacBook Air is that it's really light, really yeah. light. And fast because of the SSD. And we, we've been talking about SSDs in general. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've love done a lot. Right. I've done SSD transformations for most of my machines already. Um, I've got a few more to do. But, yeah, going forward, I knew that whatever I bought would be SSD A. And, um, and, and on the MacBook Air, it's interesting because this machine has a, a, a processor that's two generations old. It's ancient right? and slow. It's, it's like 1.6 gigahertz. It's nothing. Yeah, it's not, it's not the current gen. It's not the no. previous gen. It's the one before that. Which makes me ask. Why? Yeah, why oh, did no, you sorry. buy, say, a Lenovo X220, which is thin and light? Yeah. Well, I have a, a Lenovo X200 here, and I know from experience, and, and I also say I purchased and then returned a Lenovo uh, ThinkPad 120, oh, okay. uh, which is the new Ultra Mobile one they have. But this, the, this new one The is problem so with both of those machines are the same. Oh. The, uh, even though they have full size and good or excellent keyboards, the 220 has an excellent keyboard, the 120 has a good keyboard. So there's the full ThinkPad uh, keyboard experience, which you get on the bigger machines. And then there's kind of a halfway, uh, they have a new island style keyboard that's actually better than a typical Apple, uh, I'm sorry, a typical island style keyboard. And, uh, what's, an island? what's an island? I don't know. Right, so if that. you look at your MacBook, yeah. that's an island style keyboard where the keys appear to rise like islands Got it. Out, of the, out of the base of the machine, if you Got will. It. So if you were to take the keyboard away, the keyboard is not one big, well, the keyboard is one big piece underneath, but the keys are individual and they pop up through the the bottom of the machine. That's an island style keyboard. Got it. Apple's is very typical. I'm, I'm always amused when people say the Apple keyboard is good because it's really just typical. It's, there's no, uh, you know, they're not curved in any way to meet the, the curve of your finger. You know, they're, they're just square and they just pop up through the bottom of the thing. Yeah, I've, no, never, I've never heard anybody rave about the uh, MacBook. Oh, I see this a lot. And, really? I, and uh, yeah, so uh, the way I put it, it, that's not a good, that's not an example, by the way, when you're looking at it. It's that's not? not? This is an older one. No, you need to look at your MacBook Air. Or okay, I don't have it with me. Or, you know, an Apple keyboard is, uh, if so you have a... This is a, this is a two, MacBook, but it's an older 17 no, this is an older one. Yeah, because no, no, no. this is But curved. you know what the new ones look like. There's actually a... You can see between each key there's a space, and, and you know, the, the, the bottom of the keyboard is, it just has holes for, all, for each individual key. On the, on the one you just showed, that keyboard is one big piece that can be removed as, you know, right off the top of there, basically. Uh, they do it a little bit differently now. Here it is. Here's an here's an air. Yeah. So um, there's an. There so this right is there. an. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I know. I don't like these actually. I don't like this. Yeah. Keyboard. I mean, they're fine. I, the way I put it is, they're. It's I like a say calculator. Me. They're saying in the chat room. It's like a calculator. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's the full ThinkPad keyboard, which is just unmatched, and and I don't, I don't want to get blue here, but the way I try <laughs> oh, to. It's the best it, in the so world. It's like having sex with your fingers. I mean, it's. Wow. You know, it's. Yeah, I know. They're, no, they're they're perfect. Surprised I mean, they're you admit to that. There you go. So the next one down is on uh, some of the thinner ThinkPads and IdeaPads and some of the other uh, yeah. Lenovo machines. They have an island-style keyboard, but the keys are individually sculpted to be somewhat curved. Right. And they, they try to replicate the feel of the full ThinkPad keyboard uh, on this other type of keyboard. Now, I don't think they've succeeded at that. I would say it's the next step down. But it's still above the typical island-style keyboard that you see on a so, Mac, so the, the you, you want you don't want the island style, but you want the thin and light. Yeah, is that right? Because I mean, I'm looking right. at so the X220. I, 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 this is a yeah. typical Lenovo. There you go. You that's bang full, hard on a keyboard. Right, and it's the full. That's the full deal. And you, right. so you can see there the red dot in the middle. You get the nice pointer that they have. Yeah, I hate that thing. Um, but at least they have. Which, a I know, but I too. but I prefer it. So when I'm out on the road and I don't have my mouse with me, that thing is so that's precise, uh, unlike a trackpad that I just don't need to bring a mouse. And the reason I need that is for graphics. So I do graphics right. uh, for each of my stories. Right. And I, it, you know, there's some precise work there. And, and having something precise, like a mouse or that little nubbin thing, is, you know, what I need or what I want. Anyway, anytime you buy a, a portable machine, you're looking at compromises, right? So I could buy a, a ThinkPad with the full keyboard, but I can't use the one you just showed because the, uh, the, de the lid part in the front, the, the wrist rest, is not deep enough. I've got really big hands. And the problem with the X220, the problem with the X120, is that that wrist rest area is not deep enough. And so I, 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 with the 120, I'm not, I'm not joking when I say within five minutes of using it, the tops of my wrists hurt. Uh, and I knew I couldn't keep it. And so I had to return it, you know, uh, and I lost about a bucks and, you know, the restocking fee um, because it just wasn't going to cut it. Right. So the compromises here, and the reason to go with the MacBook Air over anything else is simply it's the thinnest, lightest, 
best battery life, you know, all of those things that actually matter when I'm away. I look, when I look, I travel uh, a lot. And when I look at the trips that I go on, like the last two or the one before that, you know, I'm typically gone for less than a week, right? So really portability, the, the weight of the mm -hmm. thing is the big deal. Now, I, I still need a full-size keyboard. It's not again, really much, it doesn't feel much heavier than um, a, uh, an iPad, actually. It's, but, it okay, so that's so interesting that you say that. Uh, if you look up the stats, if you look up the actual specs of the machines, uh, the MacBook Air, the one I have, I'm sorry, you probably have an 11. I have the 11, right? yeah. Yeah, so the 13-inch, the which is the one I got, the one I would have to use because, it's, again, this is uh, from an ergonomic standpoint and also from an eyesight standpoint. I can't look at an 11-inch screen with a really high-res display. I mean, I'm getting old. I just can't do it. It's just too small. Um, so 13-inch, I think, is the baseline for someone of my size, unfortunately, but it has that full-size keyboard, which is important. It's got great battery life, um, great portability, good weight and all that. The 13-inch is about twice as heavy as, um, as an iPad. It says, but it's funny when you when you hold them <laughs> next to each other, it's not that much heavier, really. I mean, it really isn't. I mean, in having isn't it ironic. I mean, it's it must be an optical illusion, but it just doesn't feel. No, it feels. No, well, let's put it this no. way: it's comfortable. I, it's easy to hold. It yeah, and and the, even without a case, I can. I feel like I can hold right. it under my arm and just carry it around. Now, compared to the laptop I usually travel with, which is a, a one of the heavier, bigger ThinkPads, the yeah. MacBook Air is about half as heavy. I mean, it's like half yeah. the weight. Did you um, look so at other, like the Samsung? Did you look at other did, extra I thin did. light? Yeah, so there's a new Samsung, uh, that one you're showing. What's the model? The S uh, series, I think, uh, whatever yeah. the name of it. Samsung series. 9, yeah. Um, that was the, yeah, that was That's one beautiful. I seriously looked at. Uh, again, you can see the same thing. Island-style island keyboard. Brushed, to, it looks like black brushed aluminum, which is incredible. Yeah. Thinner yeah, yeah. and lighter than the Air. Yeah, a little, a little bit. I mean, I think we're, we're kind of yeah. know, crossing yeah, at this point, point. yeah, yeah. Um, Honestly, the difference there was basically battery life and just style. I, I find the the look of that to be a little this Star is, Trek. This next is generation. Darth Vader's notebook. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. I just don't like the style of it. Th no there's, uh, there's something understated be. about the uh, ThinkPads. <sighs> I mean, I'm sorry about the uh, the MacBook Air. So, I'm probably going to throw a. Now, are I'm you going to run time... OS 10 on it? I mean, no, no, no. It's no. just going to be a Windows machine for you. Yeah. See, I think that's I really have... an interesting play because nowadays you really can. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's probably a pricier machine than you'd need to buy. Yes. Oh, no, no. Listen, I, there there are a lot of... When when you talk about, again, compromises abound here, uh, no doubt about it. It only has two USB ports. That's okay. It doesn't have Ethernet, which is actually a problem because I go to conferences and things where sometimes that's the only way to get connected. Yeah, it comes with an Ethernet the, dongle, USB dongle. So it's fine. I use that a lot, actually. Um, it doesn't come with a DVD drive, which I couldn't care less about. My next laptop wasn't going to have one anyway. And if I had gone yeah. with the high-end ThinkPad I was looking at, I would have bought the extra battery and replaced the optical drive with that. I just couldn't care less yeah. uh, about optical drive. Um, I had to buy it online because if you buy it in a store, you can only get it with two gigs of RAM, which is crazy to me. Um, so you have to actually custom order it, yeah. and that costs another hundred dollars. I put four in mine as well, but that yeah, was I did, the only, yeah. I, but I didn't. Get, I got the sixty-four gig drive, especially if you're only putting Windows on it. That's probably enough. Yeah, I did go with 128. Well, I had on on the 13 inch. It starts at 128. Oh, so, that's right. Uh, okay, that's not bad. So, I did. Uh, I have to say, I I just bought <laughs> an mm -hmm. aftermarket uh, SSD for the Air. That's 256 gigs. So I I I say you don't only need 64. That's interesting. And does and you can is that's user serviceable? Like you can actually yeah. They send you it uh, maxsales.com. They send you the mm -hmm. uh, Torx tool that you need to open these little tiny screws. And they say it's easy to do once you do that. It's a yeah. it's a SIM card. It's not. It doesn't look like a drive. It looks no, like I know. A SIM it card. actually plugs into the motherboard. It's like yeah. a long thin. It looks like a yeah, like a, I'm sorry. It looks like what you just said. It looks like a SIM card. I mean, it's uh, like another 500. Bucks. Like a DIM card. So yeah, it would be right. Of course, of course. But it's uh, it's also faster because it's got a Sandforce controller. Apple, you know what? Oh, you know what got me going? You're gonna get the new the newer uh, Samsung. Uh, oh, I, SSD. I already have it, so I, I can I can check for that. I don't know. Yeah, um, I have the older because I bought it right away. At Toshiba. I don't think it matters. I mean, well, I, 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 it's well, honestly, significant. Look, I can tell you how this thing's gonna go anyway because um, what I'd like to see Apple do, and I'm surprised they didn't when they just rev their Pro machines, is go to this style for the bigger machines. And I wouldn't. I, I'd be. I'd seriously consider a 15-inch version just for the real estate and on the screen and so forth. Um, so I, I think what's going to happen is eventually I'll upgrade to something, whether it's another Mac or a, you know, whatever. I mean, some PC maker might come along with something just as good. It's funny because I've been really lusting after the, uh, the Lenovo. <laughs> yeah. Well, which one? The X220? Yeah, the new 220, yeah. I, again, I, it's probably fine for you. My, I have serious constraints. I mean, one of the, one of the things I write about in this article is over the years I would go to Comdex and CES, whatever, 
and, and the international press would be there. And I would see these people from Japan with these machines where the, the entire computer was smaller than one of those Apple Bluetooth keyboards. You know, they use these really tiny yeah, but machines. That's too small. No, it is for me. I'm a yeah. big American guy. But I mean, uh, from, a, from a portability or mobility perspective, I've always lusted after something like that. And the problem is when I use a netbook or when I use that ultra mobile machine like the Lenovo I just talked about, or even the X220, which is a full-size 12-inch machine, but because of that wrist rest really is constrained in a, in a different way. They're just too small. I can't do it, right. you know, so we'll see. So um, I'm actually curious. Uh, so you've already put Windows 7 on it. No, I've got it. I'm actually, I was burning through it and I didn't have a chance to finish it before we started. But yeah, so that's you, what I'm doing. You, uh, and will you do that using Apple's boot camp? I guess you almost have to because you need their gonna, drivers, right? Well, I'm going to try it two different ways. So um, what I would like to do is, uh, now see, I don't have a, I don't have the drive. I don't have an optical drive. So I want to see if I can get the machine to boot off of the USB key. And if I can, I'll do a boot from the Windows 7 USB key. And I will wipe everything out and I'll install it that way. Now, if I can't do that for some reason, I will install it using Boot Camp. Now, Boot Camp still looks for an optical drive, but there are tools, and I think one of them is called Refit or something, that allow you to uh, install Windows from a USB key, same thing. But then you would still have that Boot Camp partition. That's fine. I don't mind having a little bit of... Little Mac OS X. It's just yeah, a little cute little thing on the side there. Uh, by the way, I will, I, I'll tell I'm you something. I really want to see how you do this, because I, I think this does yeah. make an excellent Windows machine. I'm going to write about the have different to, options. You'll you know, have to paint uh, over the Apple on the top there. Right, so. so actually what I have are Windows logo stickers. And every <laughs> Mac I've ever owned, I put a Windows logo over the sticker, over the, uh, over the light. Um, <laughs> so I've done this. I mean, I've done this for numerous machines. I've had many Macs. I mean, I, you know. Um, and well, you can use a say, portable DVD drive. Somebody asked, and I do have a USB DVD drive that uh, is designed for you. Yeah, yeah, right. If you, you wish me Apple to ship it out to you, I will be Actually, glad to. Actually, what am I talking about? I have a USB DVD drive. Uh, so I, but I, not I, all of them work. <laughs> okay. So I could, I'll try that. I will, yeah. If I have to, I, you know, that's one thing I'll try. Yeah. I, I'll say a couple things I just want to throw out about this, you know, or the machine or Macs in general, whatever it is, with regards to Windows. Um, you know, one is I had done a focus group for Microsoft recently, as you know, with the signature PCs. And with that in the back of my mind, I was very interested to compare the out-of-box experience of the Mac with that uh, of these PCs. And one thing, you know, that I don't think gets written about enough is from opening the box, and I, I took some pictures, obviously, like a goofball, <laughs> uh, which I'll throw hey, at in. At least you, you know. didn't stream a live unboxing. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, no, I have... Uh, you have some... some I have some credibility. Um, <laughs> the, I hope you did it in the dark, in the back, <laughs> in a yeah, corner. Yeah. <laughs> so My precious. The, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, from opening that box until getting to the point where you have installed all of the updates that you have to install, you know, it's like an hour. I mean, it actually takes an hour. And the reason is it had 1.6 gigabytes, think about this, of updates to install. Oh, man. Over two reboots. I took pictures of it. It was crazy. I, I, I cannot believe how much stuff had to be installed. You know, updates to Snow Leopard and all of the built-in apps and all that stuff. I mean, um, you know, people are always kind of dumping on Windows for that. And I'm sorry, but I'm not saying that's worse than Windows necessarily, but it's got to be just as bad. I mean, that, that's, that's crazy. I mean, that's just a lot of stuff. Hey, I just got a, a BlackBerry uh, playbook. And I, before yeah. they allowed me to use it, yeah. I had to install 273 megabytes of updates. You know what else is like that is Google TV, right? Oh, Google TV's Google, got four it, or five updates. You, Google TV At least is, with the playbook, I could do one update and it was up to date. Yeah. So what's funny about it is it's useless out of the box. And then once you get all those things installed, it's like semi-useless, right? I mean, like yeah. that, that's the improvement you've made. I mean, so it, it technically works, but then you realize you don't really want to use it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, you know, we'll see how it goes. I mean, I, I, I've talked to people, you know, people write me and they ask me about MacBooks and running Windows on them and all that. And it's been a little while. I mean, I, the last Mac that I used was one of those black MacBooks, right? Not the MacBook Pro, but a black MacBook. Um, so this is the first notebook I've had since then. I, I've had a Mac mini. I had a Mac mini in here since last year or whatever, but, um, so I'm curious, you know, about this whole process and the different ways you can do it. You know, I, I think there's a little bit of, uh, goofiness that goes around. You know, people get something new and they kind of want to play around and stuff. And and I know there's a, a temptation to run Windows under a virtual environment and yada, yada, yada. And, and you know, that stuff works okay for what it is. I mean, and, but you have to remember what, what it is, is, which is 
you do that to run an app that you just can't have on the Mac for some reason or some app you need for work or whatever it is. So uh, running Windows under the Mac is not a great experience, as good as that stuff has gotten. Oh, I and disagree. I, I, I disagree. I, well, hold on. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. I mean as Windows. In other words, you're not going to get the full Windows experience. Oh, you mean in virtualization versus yes. in boot? Yes. Because yeah, yeah, I yeah. do a dual boot on any machine I have enough of hard drive on. I can't do it on the air. It's too small. But on my right. MacBook Pro and on my big i7 uh, Mac Pro, Windows yeah. runs beautifully. Well, no, no, no. I, I mean in virtualization. In other words, I agree with you. It's okay to run apps. Although I have yeah, to say... Yeah. I have to say, on your air, it won't. But if you have enough horsepower, if you've got an i7 and 8 gigs of RAM, which I do on the big yeah. desktop, no, no, the I, virtualization I, feels pretty native. Except you don't get glass in Windows 7. Yes, you do. Oh, you do on the Mac? Oh, absolutely. Okay. okay, so that's okay. And that's, been, that's because both Parallels and Fusion, VMware Fusion, support that. Okay. have yeah, improved right. so it's been a while. their capability. I, I, it's been so long since I've uh, you know done that. I just don't see the point of it. But yeah. I, I guess uh, what I've said to people about this, and I think you probably ultimately agree with this, is simply... Um, look, you get a MacBook or MacBook Pro or Mac, iMac, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And yes, you may have some belief, if you're just doing this as an enthusiast, you may believe that running both of these things side by side makes a lot of sense. But I think ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to pick one or the other and pretty much go with that. And I think on that note, it's, it's a good idea, a really good idea, if you can do it, to have these things both running in boot camp and then you can choose between the two. But ultimately... Unless you have a real work-related need to run a single app and you've chosen the Mac, a single Windows app, right. uh, you know, you're probably not going to be running virtualization. So it's like it's one of those things, like, I guess as an enthusiast, I think we all go through this phase where it's like, well, this can work for me and right. I'm going to do this. But the reality is it's not really a, a viable long-term solution. I think you should... Uh, like, the problem is you don't have a real super powerful Mac, as you say. You've got the, the no. Airs. I can't. There's no way on a car to do. You're gonna yeah do this kind of thing. So uh, on the, on an i7 or I suppose even an i5 based uh, computer with enough horsepower, virtualization runs pretty yep. nicely, and I uh, I feel yep. comfortable. No, no, now remember, right. I, I do it only because, like you, I mean, not like you actually, but uh, I, it's been so long, and I you know again, uh, I just don't, you know I'm not gonna run. I mean, look, I I am. I am a Windows guy. I'm not running Windows right. under a Mac. I I'm need both. Yeah. And in fact, I run Linux yeah. under it as well. I need sure. it all because that's I cover them all. Yeah. So I'm a little in a different situation. I mean, for me personally, I kind of dispense with this pretty quickly. But um, but yeah, I mean, I've looked at it because, you know, we've written a little bit, a bit about it for the uh, Windows 7. It's gotten because, better. It's gotten better. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's different ways to do it. I will say, just generally speaking, if you've ever run something like virtual PC on Windows or even VMware Workstation, I think you'd be surprised by how much better... Infinitely. That stuff is on the Mac. And I don't know why. It's even things like Parallels, which is a relatively recent development in this world, uh, performs amazingly well for that kind of thing. No, I, That's I agree. I and I, I think what you're seeing, of course, is, and this has always been the case, at Mac users have always had to live in a Windows world. So I think they go the extra mile to make it work better on a Macintosh. Windows users don't really. It's not. I mean, look, you've got Windows. Yeah, and 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 uh, if this was possible from a legal or licensing standpoint, it would be far more interesting to me personally, and and I think to a lot of people. Not, I'm not saying the majority of people, but to a lot of people, to be able to run Mac OS 10 in a virtual environment on Windows Wouldn't only that be because nice? the only reason I the only reason I would want to do it, and I realize there's no market for this kind of thing, is just for testing purposes. Yeah. In other words. Rather than having a dedicated Mac sitting here that does nothing most of the time, if I could just run Mac OS X in a virtual environment, any time that Apple came out with something like the App Store or whatever, it would be a place to go in and look at something like that and just do it very cheaply. Um, you know, it wouldn't matter if the performance wasn't great. I would just want to have an understanding of what right. they were doing. Um, I'd love to be able to do that, it but I can't. that you can't do that. That's yeah. Apple, of course, won't let you. Yeah, no, it's understandable. I don't, can you Hackintosh in virtualization? I have no idea. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. But so I'm. I have to say though, um, I put Windows on all my machine, all my Macs, and I run yeah. lots of Windows machines. But I put Windows on all my machines now, and Linux. And uh, if you've got enough, <laughs> you sound like a sound like a Microsoft commercial over there. <laughs> I put Windows on all of my Macs. <laughs> you know? And and well, and as Walt Mossberg. Mac Shill admittedly said, the, "My best yeah. Windows machine is a Macintosh. It does run pretty well." <laughs> I mean, look, like I said, there, there are compromises. I mean, even the keyboard itself is a compromise in the sense that the uh, the Windows key is the command key, which isn't... It, it, oh, yeah, that's it, an issue. The command yeah. key and the alt key are in the wrong location, yeah. so they're yeah. kind of switched. It's not a big deal. I mean, if you've been... I've been doing this for years, so I, I, I'm familiar with it. It's okay. Uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to say was, uh, you know, the MacBook Air, as you know, comes with a little USB 
sliver thing. It's kind of cute looking. And, and it's because the machine doesn't come with a, uh, an optical drive that can't give you a disk, right, to restore the system. But that little USB key can be used to install the Windows drivers right. uh, in boot camp. And I'm assuming if you just install Windows on it and nothing else, you could use that little thing. Uh, I'm curious so because I... Th I'll let you know because yeah. I'm heading there. <laughs> I'm going of course, the drivers are on there, but it's my memory that mm -hmm. um, it uses Apple's boot camp uh, to install, but maybe not. I, be, I, I really so. I think, love to know that. I think that. you literally insert... The way it works with the disks, because I've done it a million times, is after Windows is installed, you just install the, the Mac in. OS X install disk in, right. and it it's a driver comes disc. up with the Windows drivers. Okay, yeah. so that's it. So no, the, I'm, I'm guessing USB it works exactly the same, same way. Yeah. In fact, I could just plug it in my Windows machine to find out. Yeah, I think you, I, no, actually, I think you're right. I think so. Yeah, that's what I'm expecting. Yeah, they probably have a Windows partition. They have I've just to. got the thing today, so I haven't done everything yet. But um, yeah, that's where I'm heading. So, well, I'd be very curious. We're going to take a break. We're talking to Paul Thorat. Yes, we're talking about Microsoft. Why do you ask? We'll be. <laughs> I just talked about installing Windows a lot there. I'm, I'm not sure what the complaint is. <laughs> I know people don't. I think somebody in the chat room said, "When are you going to do a Windows show?" And I think people don't even if you say the word Apple, they don't even pay attention. They yeah. go, "Ugh." Yep. There's just an aversion. I you wish. We, I wish we didn't have to uh, treat it like a team sport. Like, I know. Miners. Windows. I, it, it's it's not a team. You sport. know, it's it's 2011. Could we just move we just on? Move on. There are a lot of Macs in the world. Uh, Go you know, fight about the iPhone and Android. That's a, yeah, exactly. Knock yourself out. Hey, uh, we are brought to you by the ultimate cross-platform solution for support, actually. It's called Go to Assist Express. You see, if you're in the support business, you don't have often don't have the luxury of saying, no, I'm not going to support uh, Windows. No, I'm not going to support Mac. You support what your users use, right? Uh, and we live in a heterogeneous world. Get over it. That's why I love Go to Assist Express. I could support a Mac from a PC, a PC from a Mac, Mac to Mac, PC to PC. It doesn't matter. Put Go to Assist Express on your computer. In fact, if you go to assist. Go to. I should never say go to. If you visit, because it's so confusing. If you visit go to assist. Com slash Windows, you can install Go to Assist Express right now, free for thirty days. It's the. It's a fit based on Citrix. Uh, remote access technology, they really do know remote access better than anybody. But they've added features for the Support Pro. Uh, and if you're a Support Pro, you'll you'll immediately grok why this is so great. Eight sessions at once. So you start a scan on one and install on another, and you keep going. You're not waiting. Nothing worse than, you know, you're doing a remote session, you start something, and now you're sitting twiddling your thumbs. I mean, of course, you, you, could, you could play Halo 2, but this way you get more done. Uh, unattended supports, so you don't have to wait for your clients to show up at the system that you, you can go in there and fix the system right now at your convenience, not their convenience. That's huge. It has um, a system assay button, so you can say, what, what operating system version? What's, what uh, what um, uh, service pack are they running? What security software? What's running in the background? All of that is so helpful to the Support Pro, and, and this is what I mean. It's, it's carefully tuned to give you that very high-quality remote access Citrix is famous for, including 128-bit SSL security. Uh, they have their own 24-7 support for you. Um, and it's, of course, very, very fast. They, you know, there are a lot of, I know there's a lot of remote access, a lot of remote support even out there, things like TeamViewer. But nobody is more optimized. Nobody's more optimized for performance for your job than the folks at Citrix. So I want you to try this one for free for the next 30 days. Go to Assist dot com slash windows you even they have a little chat window you can chat with your clients so you can reassure them no i'm not breaking your machine you could tell them and whatever you do when they ask you to install that any spyware software next time say no things like that you can say it just like that gently go to assist dot com slash windows try it free today you love it mac versus pc is so partisan <laughs> this is our chat room. Yes, right. You can tell by the verses in the title. Mm, mm. <laughs> That's how you know. PC. Yeah. No, this is the Windows show. I know it. And we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, Windows phone coming to Nokia. Did you ever confirm that Microsoft paid, what was it, a billion dollars to Nokia for that? Yeah, uh, not the amount, but they're, uh, they just announced this morning that they've officially signed this agreement. It's done. Right? It's a done deal. And... They, they don't detail amounts, but what they do detail is that money is changing hands. And it's really kind of interesting the way they 
they word it because the money's going in both directions. But yes, Microsoft will pay Nokia billions of dollars. Billions with, uh, a, with an S. Yes, in recognition of the unique nature of Nokia's agreement with Microsoft. Wow. <laughs> it's like a thank you payment. Well, we used to do this in, in uh, Tech TV used to do this um, because ultimately when you go to a cable channel and they're airing your channel, you get paid. Just as Microsoft will get paid for each Nokia phone sold with Windows on it. Mm -hmm. But in order well, to get yes. them to do the deal, you go to them with this little black bag. It's called marketing dollars. That's like a like an upfront payment. So, so I suspect that's like that. It, it's really, you know, again, there's no way to understand who's getting the better end of the deal. Yeah, if Nokia you will. may end up I mean, paying I, billions back to Microsoft. Well, th there are three mentions of money changing hands in this agreement, and I want to let's see. I believe two of them are. Let me just make sure. Yes, two of them are where money is going from Microsoft to Nokia. Yeah. So one is the the billions, and that's their word uh, wow. that I mentioned previously. Wow. The other one is. Uh, Microsoft will deliver substantial payments, again, their term, to Nokia for its mapping, navigation, and location-based services for the intellectual property rights of those things because those features from Nokia will be added to all Windows phones. Oh, interesting. That's right? the Avi, Avi store? They're not going to brand it that, but yeah, uh, mapping, navigation, and location-based services. Interesting. So uh, they're going to pay for that. And like you said, Microsoft is going to get paid by Nokia on a license, like a royalty basis for Windows Phone OS. So the, the money's going back in that direction as well. Now, obviously, the success or failure of this agreement isn't just about who has more money in the pocket at the end of the day. It's about this brand becomes established, hopefully does become that number two that uh, IDC and Gartner believe they're going to be, and that both companies are successful as a result. I mean, I think that's ultimately uh, where this is. If, if it works out that Microsoft has... Uh, ultimately paid Nokia more than Nokia has paid Microsoft after, say, 10 years. But yet, now they're the m number two mobile platform in the world, and they have a viable mobile alternative to desktop versions of Windows. I'm, I'm sure Microsoft couldn't care less, because now they have this you know, viable business. Worth audience. billions to them. Yeah. And that was the deal with cable, is that you get the money back in the long run. So it's just to get over that initial hump of, okay, we've got to redesign our phones we've got to test them we've got to make sure they work we've got to release new windows focused phones we've got to say goodbye to Symbian. Yeah. all of these write-offs so mm -hmm. we'll help you with that because we know in the long run the money's going to start flowing in the opposite direction yeah uh, this is a big deal you know and and the ramifications of this are not going to be well understood i don't think for some time to come because it's not just what happens between nokia and microsoft it's what happens out in the market it's what happens between microsoft and their other existing partners you know um, what's going to happen to HTC and Samsung with regards to Windows Phone going forward? You know, do they stay in this market? Do they feel like they've gotten screwed? You know, how how does that happen? Um, will Nokia's customers embrace Windows Phone, or will they take this as an opportunity to say, well, you know, we've been kind of ignoring this iPhone and Android stuff for a while. Maybe now it's uh, time we go take a look at that. Um, it's hard to say. So there's I a lot of stuff here. How much is it worth to become the Number two or three platform. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's worth the a billions lot. and billions. I yeah. would say, yeah. This is the mainstream computing market of the future, no doubt mm -hmm. about it. It's arguably the mainstream computing market of today. Uh, you know, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, and I think you, I think you could make the case that if you um, are a fan of Microsoft, that this <laughs> was something that it, they needed to do and is very good for them. They have to. Yeah, it, it doesn't. You know, it's funny. Uh, partnering with Nokia does not erase all of the disadvantages you get from not being Apple, right? That single uh, company advantage. There are just some inherent advantages to being the one company. Um, in other words, in, in, the next step up for Microsoft would be for them just to make their own Windows phone, right? But this is about as close as I think Microsoft can get. And uh, hopefully, with the sheer amount of devices that Nokia intends to make, they're talking about 12 or more by the end of next year, and hopefully with the market power that Nokia has, hopefully with the additional services that Nokia will be adding to all Windows phones, regardless of whether you buy a Nokia a device or not, you know, that this has a, a positive impact on the, on the platform. You know, we'll see. I mean, the, the, the sad thing is, um, you know, two turtles don't make a hair, right? I mean, one of the problems, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, one of the problems with these companies is neither one of them is known for moving particularly quick. Right. So, um, yeah, we'll see. You know, obviously Nokia has new leadership now, so maybe, um, you know, maybe they can make that happen. And there's no dig on Stephen Elop. I don't know the man per se, 
Um, but I'll just point out that the last business he ran was Office. Now, Office is very successful, but Office is also on one of those three to four year churn cycles. So uh, it's not like Office at the time was coming out with new products every six months or whatever. So um, we'll need to wait and see, you know, how quickly these companies can move in the future and, and, and move also in lockstep in the future, right? So um, we'll see. I, I, I'm intrigued by this, certainly. And, and the, the pictures I've seen of these devices, these prototype devices uh, that Nokia supposedly has, we don't really know that they're real, but um, are very interesting looking, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, they're really, really kind of cool looking. So you think, so you think it'll be a, a appealing device? I mean, Nokia makes good hardware, let's face it. Yeah, they and they're an unknown in this, in this country, right? So I think people uh, are going to be... Surprised, I think, by the quality of these things. I'm actually a big Nokia fan. I always have been. Um, yeah, I've yeah. owned many a Nokia phone. In fact, I even, I've mentioned before, have the current N8. And I would just point out in the in the Neutron movie, you know, the kid uses Nokia phone to <laughs> into that thing. So you know, they're good. I, I you know, it's so funny because <laughs> I, I can't watch weird. a movie anymore. I was yeah, watching that yeah. last night of all things, mm -hmm. and I saw that big Nokia, and I said, yeah. product placement. Really? Product placement. placement, you know, it's it's product placement that means zero to people in this country, but maybe that resonated in Europe and elsewhere. I don't know. Same thing in Star Wars, the new Star Wars. Wasn't it Nokia, a Nokia phone that he dialed when he was driving? Star to... Wars? Not Star oh. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> in the new Star Trek. Oh, when the, oh I don't remember that. Could yeah, be. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Captain so he had Kirk. A Nokia device. The little, the little James Tiberius Kirk, the young one. Yeah. I think he was dialing a Nokia phone. Oh, that could be. Right before he drove off the cliff. Oh, it's like the Futurama joke. So in other words, um, Nokia is still around in the future, right? So in That's Futurama, the point. In Futurama, he goes to the future, and he's trying to pay for something, and he says, uh, you take MasterCard. No, MasterCard disappeared in 2065. Oh, do you take Visa? <laughs> no, Visa uh, died in 2130, whatever, you know. Do you take American Express? No, we don't take American Express. No, the Amer American Express has been, has been gone since 21, whatever. Do you take, uh, what's the other one? Discover. Oh, no, we don't take Discover. <laughs> so <laughs> Discover is still around. But we don't but take it. But it's Discover because <laughs> nobody takes Discover. We right? still don't take it. I just watched that joke. Diners Club? <laughs> yeah. no. That's funny. I thought, there, I thought you were going to say something like, but I do take Apple. Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but you know, in other words, like Discover, no one takes Discover. But that, so that's right. the one that, you know. Don't, don't you have it. an iPhone? You can, you can charge it with that. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's move on. You, sp you yes, mentioned yes. Office, uh, Office 365. The beta went public this week. How's that going? I signed up. Yeah, I, I think that Office 365 is going to be huge. I agree. Um, I'm very there's, impressed. There, there's some weird little issues occurring with this public beta that I'd like to try to explain um, for some of the people who are looking at some of the more advanced scenarios. But um, the way to put this simply is there's an enterprise, or actually there's not just one, there, there are enterprise versions because they, they have different plans. That's the thing I have to say. Yeah. The only thing that bugged me about it is you have to choose so, whether you're a small business or a big business. Right. So in, during the beta, the, the beta is, I think, small business only. Um, the big distinction, well, actually, there are many distinctions, but the big distinction between small business and enterprise is that the small business one is aimed at uh, 25 or fewer users. Right. But what if so you're an individual? Small, then you go small business. Um, small business works for one or more. It just right? confused me. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's like, well, I'm I'm not an enterprise or a small business, so so I should just pick small business. Uh, yeah, right, right, right. So I, I don't think there's going to be a big marketing push for uh, Office 365 for individuals per se. Well, that's what made me wonder that maybe they don't want me. No, they do want you. They do want you. So um, Office 365, in many ways, is the new version of a service that's already out in the market called BPOS or uh, Business Productivity Online Services. The, from there are, again, there are differences between the two. Uh, some of them include such things as Office 365 has the latest versions of the servers, right? The 2010 era versions of the servers, whereas BPOS is still in uh, 2007. Um, but BPOS is also aimed at mid-sized businesses and up, pretty much. So uh, you have to have at least five people to get an account on BPOS today. Ah. So on Office 365, you could do it as an individual. Got it. And I think the cheap scheme, the the one you'd be looking at, would be about six dollars a month. Now so, it does it does say that it's going to take two to four weeks to get you into the beta. There's a waiting list, yeah. And right are now they, there are is. They, is, so that's true. Yeah, because uh, they're trying to roll people out over time to make sure the service stands up to right. the volume. Um, but you know, I think what's so I would say com you compare this to Google Apps, the business version of Google Apps, right. uh, whatever that's called, Google Apps. It's called what's Google it called? Apps. 
Google Apps, okay. Google so, Docs is the free one. Right, but there's a free version of Google Apps as well, right? So there's a pay, the paid version of Google Apps. Google Apps is for business. Okay, it's fifty dollars a year it's uh, per person, whereas the Microsoft service that we're talking about here is about seventy-two dollars uh, per year, right? Sixty six times twelve, yeah. So um, for twenty-two dollars more a year, what you're getting here is you know real exchange with all the Exchange Active uh, Sync policy support, which is awesome. So you can actually require that your users have certain mobile policies, uh, which is a really neat feature. Uh, it has full SharePoint, which is awesome for collaboration. It has I the love Office SharePoint. apps. Yeah. So you get all that stuff. And it also has Link, which is their uh, enterprise class uh, communications uh, um, service, uh, sort of like instant messaging, essentially, but also presence information and some other stuff. Um, if you move up to the enterprise um, stuff, you, you get additional features and uh, capabilities across a variety of plans, but you also get access to the full Office suite, the uh, downloadable. Mm -hmm. So. so so for bigger businesses, you know, oh, there's some tease. Things. Yeah. But yeah. if you, you know, I, I think for small businesses, you know, if, if you think about the consumerization of business, if you will, or you think about like a startup or a small, very small business, you know, people are coming in off the street with their own PCs and it's very easy to sort of office 365 it, you know, by downloading this small thing that kind of customizes your existing software so it works well with the service. So for example, if you already have Microsoft Office and you can get Office for as cheap as you know, $125 or whatever, um, it will configure the Office apps you have to work with the server stuff. So, for example, uh, the SharePoint stuff can appear in Word as a save location. And you can automatically go up and collaborate on documents with other people and so forth. If you have uh, Outlook on your PC, you can configure that to work with the Exchange server that you're using through uh, Office 365. And if you have Link, you know, the Link software comes with uh, that uh, Office Pro Plus version. Um, you can use that as an instant message application. It works with Windows Live Messenger as well. And uh, so there's a lot of neat stuff there. So the one the one answer I have for people, because their initial, you know, anytime you open this up to a bigger audience, you get some questions. There's been some stuff around the SharePoint version in, sm in the small business version of Office 365. Um, I've been using the enterprise version of Office 365, and I've had no problems with uh, uh, setting up SharePoint to work with uh, mobile devices. But I guess... The small business server, as currently configured, doesn't support an HTTPS connection. Oh. And that means you can't connect it to certain mobile device services uh, outside of the browser. So, for example, in um, the Office Hub on Windows Phone, there's a SharePoint a workspace mobile app. And I've connected this very successfully You can uh, to my own SharePoint, well, my own SharePoint server here, but also up to the, the cloud version in Office 365. And what that means is through the client on the phone, you can browse all of the documents and other uh, lists and things that you have up there from the phone, download documents, sync them to the phone, you know, edit them on the phone offline, sync them back to the server and all that stuff. But if you're using this beta version of Office 365, you can't. And it's because this capability isn't there right now, but it's coming. So if you're trying to do Office 365 and SharePoint and Windows Phone on the beta, it's not going to work, I guess, uh, through through the SharePoint client on the phone, but it will in the future. Somebody in the chat room is saying there's a, <laughs> that, that it's difficult uh, to um, deliver it to, he says, quote, dumb users, because it's yeah. a lot of clicking in the browser. Click, 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 click. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I'm, you know, uh, products like Exchange and SharePoint are very complex from an administration standpoint. Um, if you think about a typical business that is hosting this stuff themselves, you need to have the server capacity, but also the IT resources, you know, people who know what they're really doing to configure it correctly, keep them up to date, make sure everything's running properly. Um, when you look at that kind of thing and then you move it to Office 365, yeah. I mean, it's a huge win. Yeah. Um, now, from the, from the standpoint of a small business that was never going to be able to afford or handle the complexity of those servers, it's also a huge win because now you have all these capabilities. But the problem is you, don't, you, you have no understanding of the complexity of managing the server, and even through the web interface, which admittedly is much simpler and much nicer than it is for the on-premises versions of the servers, it's still some complexity. So in my own experience, I think SharePoint in particular is a very uh, hairy, to use Microsoft's term, um, server to administer. Uh, it takes a while to kind of grok what you're supposed to do to make that work because there are um, SharePoint, what I call, uh, well, maybe what Microsoft calls SharePoint sites, uh, which aren't the same as public websites, but SharePoint sites. But then there are also public websites you can host on 
SharePoint too, and you can host them side by side. They have to have their own domain names, and there's uh, issues with uh, configuring uh, an Exchange server as well, but also SharePoint with your own domains, right? Because I'm not using it on Throt.com, but you could imagine if I wanted to host Exchange server on Throt.com through Office 365 or have a SharePoint server that might appear at whatever it is, SharePoint.Throt.com or something, you know, you have to configure that stuff. And if you're not familiar with how all that stuff works, admittedly, it can be difficult because, you know, it's a if you ever gone to, you know, like a domain registrar and tried to set up all those CNAME entries and all that kind of, you know, there's a lot of plumbing work in there. That's yeah. all. So I think a lot of the issues that people are having, um, aside from that SharePoint thing I just mentioned, are based around that kind of stuff where you go, you know, you actually follow the instructions at GoDaddy.com or whatever to configure it so that your domain is working with Office 365. But sometimes those things take 72 hours or whatever to proliferate, you know, before it actually works. So. Um, and that's the thing. This is a IT. This is a business focus. So it's an IT department job, and they'll know how to do it. Yeah, right. But you know, again, as an individual, it's tough. Or as a very small business, it's doable. Um, this is a great opportunity for someone to write a book or a, you know something or have a how-to site or whatever, uh, because it is you know it, you're moving up to an enterprise enterprise class solution. Right. It's it's going to be a little bit of complexity on the back end. Yeah. Sorry, but that's the way. Uh, it is. I think it's worth it. I, Office three sixty five is awesome. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, should check that one out. Well, and it's just prettier than uh, Google Docs. It's pet well, I, it's better than Google Docs is the way I would say it. I mean, even um, you know Microsoft, even in this very first version of Office three, I'm sorry, of Office uh, web apps, which is part of the Office three sixty five, of course, you know, has created this thing that looks and works like Microsoft Office in a web browser. It works in Safari, it works in Firefox, it works in Chrome, it works in IE, obviously. Um, it's an interesting solution. It, it's, uh, you know, for certain people, you might not have to buy Office or you might not have to already have Office. And even, and again, this varies from app to app, unfortunately, but some of the web-based apps have interesting collaboration opp opportunities as well, meaning you can work on documents simultaneously and so forth. Not all of them, but they'll get there. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, uh, I don't know, did you see the... Um Paul Allen, uh, 60 Minutes bit? No, but I have read the most of the Microsoft parts you've, of his book. You've read yeah. the book? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I got to get I pre-ordered it on the Kindle, you know, so it arrived. Um, yeah, we, we talk from time to time, because I think it's because we do audible picks, uh, about industry books. Right. And how it's been a while, you know, since there's been a really good one. Um, during the Microsoft Antitrust trial, of course, there were a bunch of books about Microsoft, which was a great fertile territory, I guess. Uh, but that that kind of died off, and then there have been several books I would say about the history of Google, and they're okay. You know, they're they're not bad. Um, I've been looking for stuff that deals with the past decade of Microsoft's existence. Uh, I'd like to see a book about Apple. You know, recent day Apple, not old Apple, but the the stuff that's happened also in the past ten years. I think that'd be fascinating. Uh, but there are two books that have come out recently that are interesting in their own right. You know, one is the Paul Allen book, Idea yeah, Man. Which I got to read this. His autobiography, and of course, you know, unfortunately, or whatever, but you know, his Microsoft experience was from the founding of Microsoft through you know part of the 1980s or whatever. So it's the early part of Microsoft, and it's the part of Microsoft that's already well understood, right? The part of Microsoft's history, but of course, him being on the inside, it's still interesting. But he doesn't have any particular experience with the Microsoft of the past 10 or even 20 years, but still a fascinating story. And like I said, he was there, and plus he invented a lot of the stuff himself, so fascinating. And then the other one is In the Plex by Stephen Levy, which is also a very good book. And this is I think his, it's, his book about Google. I, yeah, I'm reading I, it now. It's really, yeah, so it's quite interesting. The reason I like his book is because he approaches Google like I would like to see a, a, another author, or, or even him, uh, approach Microsoft or Apple, which is it's not so much a straight history as it is, you kind of look at Google and you say, well, they do this, and they do this, and they do this, and whatever. You, you pick like, the top 12 things. And then you have a section in the book on each of those things. So it's not a straightforward history like, you know, this man was born in the Soviet Union in whatever year. And, you know, right. it, it doesn't do that. But it, it talks about different things. You know, Google's experience in China. All right, there's a section on Gmail, you know, which I love that stuff. So that's very interesting to me. I've already noticed a couple of factual errors in the Stephen Levy book, which I find irritating. What? Uh, Gee, that's overall, disappointing. Pretty, We're well, interviewing him next week. If you have some... Uh... Yeah, I'll give you a specific one. Um... There's a scene uh, where, and this is uh, famous because it was in a court document, Mark Lukowski was one of the original digital guys who came over to Microsoft 
with Dave Cutler and all the deck guys to do NT. Um, I believe that Mark Lukowski was very heavily involved in the file system work and so forth, but he was one of the original NT architects. And um, when he left Microsoft, you know, he went to visit Bill, uh, Steve, uh, Steve Ballmer, rather, the CEO at the time, tell him he was leaving. And Ballmer said, please tell me it's not Google. And he said, yeah, it is Google. And I guess, according to, you know, the court <laughs> affidavit or whatever, you know, Ballmer took a chair and hummed it at the wall and right. swore at him a lot. And Right. I, I read, I read so, that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, this is a court, it's in a court document. Right. So he said, I'm going to effing kill uh, Eric Schmidt. I did it before and I'm going to do it again. <laughs> so the comment from Levy is, it, this, it's kind of dumb if you can find the scene in the book. He says something like, it's kind of unclear what he meant by this, but he probably meant that, you know, that Eric Schmidt was somehow involved in a peripheral way with Netscape. Huh? And it's like, uh, what? No, what? That, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's it was called Novell. That, Maybe he got yeah, the end words mixed and he, By the up. way, he did kill Novell. Did, and, yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm so, surprised I mean, Stephen didn't even know that, and nobody, and no fact checker caught that because that's right. I mean, you right. you you immediately saw it, and I saw it too. Not only did I see it, and I it's burned in my head now that he wrote this. So you yeah. can find this I'll section in the book. That. It's there. I mean, I, these know. things happen. He could fix that. It's not a. I don't think it's a material error. No, the book sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a good book. It's um. Yeah, it's a good book. It is a good book. I like the way he set it up, like I said. And, and again, you know, a, a straightforward history of, you know, this, <laughs> this year to this year would be interesting. But I actually do like the way he set the book up. So, you know, the Paul Allen book, the one about Microsoft, is fascinating be because of the insider view. And also, you know, we're going to call this an alternative history thing in a way, but it's not. It's the real history because, you know, he never really got to tell his side of the story. And a lot of people give too much credit to Bill Gates, for example. And you learn the expected things like surprise, surprise, Bill Gates was kind of a jerk and, right. you know, took more than his fair share of credit and, and money, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, uh, that stuff's not surprising. But I love going back and reading about the early days of this, the, the microprocessors and how we saw this thing very early on, how they overcame differences between the, uh, the Motorola uh, processors that Apple was using, the Apple II, uh, and the Intel processors, of the P or, well, they weren't PCs, but the 8-bit and then later 16-bit micros were using and so forth. Um, it's just such an awesome uh, time period, and and I think before the internet, there was no real parallel to this. But of course, now with the rise of the online world, we do have interesting parallels, you know, with Google and other uh, other online companies and so forth. But um, it's a great, it's a good book. I, I don't care about the other stuff. The truth is, I don't. I, and I hate to. I don't, it sounds terrible. I mean, I don't care about Paul Allen's childhood. I don't care about. Paul Allen's experience buying the Seattle, uh, not the Seattle Super Sonic, the uh, Portland Trail Trail Blazers or yeah. whatever. Uh, I don't care about the stuff he did later on, per se. Um, intentionally curious about his years at Microsoft, right? Um, and uh, that, to me, is just, a, it's a great payoff. It's, it, it's, unless Bill Gates writes a very honest book of the same type, this may be the last great book about that stuff. Oh, that'd be sad. I hope Bill well, does I mean, write a book. But, uh, you know, I mean, time's moving on. Yeah, yeah. People will write books. No, I uh, think Bill should write a book. I do, too. I do and too. not just a, uh, you know, sanitized version. You know, Steve Jobs supposedly is writing his authorized bi well, biography. Well, he's okay. he, what he's done is he, he's okayed someone to do an authorized. He'll, he'll, I hope work closely. I hope it's honest, too. Because and I hope it's you, honest. And Steve Jobs is an enigma in the same way that Bill Gates was, and, and I, I don't think is anymore, in the sense that you get this feeling that this is all he does. You know? Um, that this is a guy who sells products that are, uh, are billed as excellent ways to take in the form of pictures and videos, and then store and edit and preserve memories. And I have a hard time picturing this guy on vacation making <laughs> his own things, you know? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I just don't see it. I, I honestly think that this guy is obsessed about what he does for a living, which Absolutely. makes him the perfect guy to do that. Absolutely. But is there a, I mean, he must, he must love people and eat meals. I, I, he must, I, I, but you don't see it. So I'm just curious, uh, you know, to see how honest his book is. Actually, I've played volleyball with him. All right. <laughs> and so he does do other things. I've had uh, well, how, I've when, had when a meal with him. When when was this? Oh, it was fifteen. So years you ago. saw him ingest food. So he's actually. <laughs> no, I played. Uh, uh, I've told this story before, so apologies to those who've heard it before. But uh, uh, it was just before Steve went back to Apple. He was still at Pixar. 
Wow. And I spent a 4th of July weekend with his, him and his family at a, at a resort with some other people. As a, We were all invited. And um, uh, he, he was a nice guy. We had fun. He, he, I was on his team. He was a nice guy. No, he wasn't. Okay, I'll be honest with you. No, I'm, I'm just I, I'm I was on his team, and he wasn't happy with my play, and he kind of, uh, he kind of uh, berated me. Your experience with him is not unique, from my understanding. Uh -huh. <laughs> but he does, he does play volleyball. No, and then there, we had some nice conversations at other times as well. Uh, oh, all right. I, I enjoyed it. But, but this uh, is, in other words, that's interesting specifically because you don't hear that kind of stuff. I know. Stuff. So right. I'm going to write that's a book why, based on I'm going to call it My Weekend with Steve. Right. Hey, listen, people have written books, you know, Unless. inside Steve's head or walking in Steve's footsteps. So, you know, yep. uh, most of these people have either never met the guy or just met him in passing. And uh, I think any experience anyone's actually had with this guy would be interesting. I sat, uh, uh, it, bo bo all, both of our kids were little. It was, that's how I know, how I know it was like 15 years ago. Actually, it might even be longer. Um, and uh, I read, I read a, a story, ch children's story to his child. He sat in my lap and mm -hmm. it's a very nice wife. Um, they're, they're vegans, so uh, they didn't eat any of the caviar. That that's like okay. Romulan that was more for me. Like, huh? Okay. Is that like Romulan or is it... <laughs> <laughs> Not vegans. <laughs> I see. <laughs> no, okay. I, I got to yes. read. I'm reading in the Plex right now, and Stephen Levy is okay. going to be a guest on this week in Google next Wednesday. Okay. Um, and I love no, his Stephen. book is good. I, I, it, and I, like I said, I like the structure of it. The writing's great. He's always done. He's, his books are good. Um, I I wish there were more books like that. And in fact, I, what you should tell the guy is he needs to write a book like that about Apple. Of the past 10 years and Microsoft of the oh, past. Oh, I two. wish he would. He did write, um, Stephen wrote the uh, yeah, perfect, great. Oh, one no, perfect he, thing and he wrote and said, yeah, he, but they, but both. No, no, but that was, uh, I, what I want is. I know. Uh, I know what you want. Or, you know, more general history, last 10 years. Yeah. You want a Tracy Kidder, Soul of the New Machine for. Yes, I do. You want, uh, and there have been some really great books. Um, the there, first chapter of du Douglas Culpin's book, uh, where they're sliding the guy, which, you know, it's not real, but. Would they're sliding the guy flat food because it's all that will fit under the door because he won't leave his room? I want that. What was the one want, about the uh, creation of Windows NT? It's such a great book. Yeah, uh, 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 Pascal uh, Zachary. J yeah, J. Pascal Zachary's book, and it was yes. called. <laughs> I'll uh, get his name eventually. It was about a bug showstopper. Uh, showstopper. Yeah. Great. Now that's a great book. Yep, we need, I, and I wonder if journal, it's basically embedded journalism. These journalists get permission from the companies to be a fly on the wall during sure. these during these important times. And uh, I I I think there's one about Macintosh, but we need ones about what's going on right now. I'd love to see that. Th these events were all from a very long time ago. You know, NT was being made. Microsurfs was a, a uh, Microsurfs is the one I'm talking about. Yeah, that's that a, was a that's fiction. Actually, it's fictional. But it and was great. I, to be honest, most of the book isn't. Is good. That first chapter. It's very funny. Uh, when they're still at Microsoft. That's the only chapter you know. I read, actually. So I shouldn't say. Yeah, it's, it's a the great only thing book. worth reading. The rest of it's oh, okay. The, the first chapter is fantastic. It's, it, it is there. its own thing. I mean, it's beautiful. <laughs> that part is worth it. They, uh, you know, like I said, they have to. They give the guy. It's pizza and salami, or whatever. It's like right. the, they can only, only feed flat, food. flat 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 foods. That's why God invented flatbread. <laughs> Microsoft has decided to appeal to the high court on this uh, IVI thing. I'm surprised. Yeah, I don't know what the point is. You know, the, the technologies that they're discussing here were removed from Word, you know, like five years ago or something. I mean, but uh, I for I got a, a patent on some kind of XML customization of documents. It's, a, it's significant. Years if, and years ago. If, I mean, it, would, it forces the a change in the way you do XML, right? I mean, it's not... Yeah, so Microsoft's argument, which I think is valid, but I also think is not going to matter, is that th there's a problem with the patent system in the United States, which, which is true, and that you, yes. too many patents are rewarded for very vague things yes. that can then come to mean almost anything, and that this is a great example of that, which it is. Um, the problem is that's not... The, the, the Supreme Court has pretty much, not ruled, but indicated that they're not concerned with that, that what they're concerned with is, you know, um, precedent uh, with regards to the law mm -hmm. and then also with regards to this exact case. And basically what they're doing is just, I, I don't think they're going to take that stuff into account. I think what they, they're, based on what they've indicated, their feeling is that that's too broad yeah. of a determination for them to make and that just looking at this case, given the current legality of the, the patent system and so forth, that 
that's how they're going to rule. And in that case, I think what they're going to rule is that Microsoft needs to hand I4I some money and then that, that this is over. So it's you'd funny because, to, I'm sorry. You'd have to give them uh, some uh, argument that it's somehow the law was unconstitutional. But I think what they're saying is, look, if the law isn't unconstitutional, it's as as intended it by, is as it is by and, you know by the yeah, by, uh, and, and Congress. If you want to yeah. change it, go to Congress. Don't there come are to us. court precedents uh, with regards to this very patent issue, as it turns out, and and so forth. Um, I think the thing that's interesting here, and I think the reason that Microsoft is fighting this is, in the scope of things, it's not a lot of money to them. It's under three hundred million dollars when you factor well, in all the. Nothing. They must the have spent more in court fees already. Yeah. So why would they fight this so hard? Or why would why would you take something like this to the Supreme Court? I think the reason is they really want to see this patent system uh, changed. Right. And I think it's because you know Microsoft, like any technology company today, has to spend an enormous amount of time and effort gaining and um, protecting their own patents, but also protecting themselves against often spurious patent. Mm -hmm. infringement lawsuits and they're hoping to change the system now's the so time this is the case, yeah. Yeah. well i don't know if now's the time but this is the time it's certainly this is when they're doing it well, this so. is one one uh, foothold they have anyway yeah hey before we go on there's lots more to talk about including a review of the blackberry playbook <laughs> okay i actually I have know, I i'm gonna go out review, to the car and, but... yeah i'm gonna go get one i'm gonna go get mine okay yeah i got it here somewhere before we talk about that though i would like to talk about Fresh books. If you do invoicing, you don't have to tell me how painful it is. I did it for years. That's until I found Fresh Books. Back in 2004, I and 2 million others since then have been using Fresh Books to do my invoicing on the web. You upload your logo. They're very professional looking. Yes, they'll do paper invoices. They'll print, stamp, and mail it for a small additional fee. But the key on this one is the, is the email invoices that they'll send out. They look like, you know, really nice professional invoices, but they have some features that um, make them extra special. First of all, the Pay Me Now button, which allows your clients to pay with a credit card or PayPal or Authorized Net. They've got a lot of uh, 11 total payment services. The fact that they do currencies from all over the world makes it very easy for you to do the currency conversion. And if you've, if you've ever billed anybody outside of the country, it's very tricky. You know, what do you bill them? I mean, how do you convert it? So you bill them in their, in their native currency. That's what you want to do. Uh, you can even set it up to automatically invoice and automatically get that invoice paid if your client agrees. That's very cool. That's a really good way to get paid faster with less work on your part. According to their user survey, FreshBooks... Users get paid on average 14 days faster once they start using FreshBooks over their own system. I'll vouch for that. It really did make a big difference. And should you have a client that doesn't pay on time, they've got automated late payment reminders. So uh, you don't have to remember that either. iPhone app, web app, they'll do the hours and tracking for you and automatically put it in the data, in the invoice. I just think this is so slick. And here's the best part. FreshBooks is free for the first three clients. So check it out. Head to FreshBooks.com. Sign up for free. Try it out. If you've got three or fewer clients, that's all you need to do. Just try it with those and see how it works for you. I love it, and I know you will too. And by the way, yes, everybody who signs up today gets put in the drawing for the weekly birthday cake. It doesn't even have to be your birthday. They will actually send you a cake. I've talked to a number of our listeners who have won cakes from FreshBooks. FreshBooks. Dot, I know, it's cool. I have to, actually. You have to. I've heard from at least yeah, uh, two people, yeah. Love your invoicing and get paid faster with FreshBooks.com. Not to mention, look, much more professional. So, it's, moving. Huh? It's pretty funny, I... I used to send my invoices in crayon, and uh, I, I really think they didn't take me seriously. <laughs> Please pay <laughs> me. <laughs> I want money. Give me I was one. Art, I went to art school uh, for a year. Did you? And, uh, Wait a minute. Yeah. Out of high school, yeah. We are learning and, uh, something right now we've never known about Paul. <laughs> well, I had a teacher, a horrible woman, a horrible teacher, and she once she used to wear it. was like a nightgown. She'd wear it to class or something like <laughs> So that's I, I, a no smock. They call that a smock. It's okay. an artist. So one, smock. one one day she said, "I don't understand why nobody respects me." And I said, "Maybe it's the clown nose." <laughs> <laughs> and what happened then, Paul? I dropped out of school. <laughs> you see, kids, <laughs> career-killing comments can happen to anybody. Yeah. 
So well, uh, were you, know, you I, a, were I do you... make my own graphics, you know, for the website. So that's well, now my... I understand. And uh, d did you draw? Were you a drawer? Oh yeah, yeah. I won. I won every award you could win as a kid. You know, the Boston Globe, Scholastic, blah, 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 whatever. I, I mean, I know this about yeah, you. I was a... Paul, that's really neat. Yeah, it was great. 35, 40 years ago, whatever that was. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe it's the really, clown I... nose. <laughs> Maybe. So the truth is, your aspirations to being a wise ass outran your aspirations to being an artist. Leo, as I said earlier in the show, you got to be true to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? I, in my playbook's out in the car where it's cooking. Yeah. But uh, uh, I did, saw one this week. We, yeah. you know, Rim was at our show, and they had one on the little yeah. show floor. I thought it was nice, and a lot of people were very taken with it. Um, I think from a form factor perspective, the size is okay. Um, I don't like, there's something, it seems like the border around the screen it's is really big, big. Yeah, it's a big bezel. It reminds me of the Nintendo 3DS, if you ever look at one of those. Mm -hmm. It's like a little screen in the middle of a big piece of plastic, yep. you know. Yep. Um, it may be, it may not be as bad as I think it is. It's just something about it. Um, but I think the big problem with the playbook is not that, is not the hardware or whatever. I think it's a solid device. I think it's going to be fine. Um, but the problem right out of the gate is just the app situation and the ecosystem situation. And the fact that, I, I mean, you know, I, I make fun of Microsoft for shipping a, you know, Windows phone with, without this feature or this feature or this thing. This thing doesn't even ship with a calendar or an email app. Isn't that weird? Out of the box. You have to have, uh, they don't call it tethering, but you have to um, link, whatever the term is, you link your BlackBerry to the playbook. Yeah, you have to have a BlackBerry. Uh, to get all the features, including uh -huh. calendaring and email, really? Uh -huh. I mean, that's, I'm sorry, but... They do say know. that eventually, this is very much like uh, the Windows Phone, Windows eventually phone. they will ship an update or people will put third-party apps in. Yeah, I I'm sure that's eventually going to be true. But, you know, the problem is I'm looking at it now and I now it's not, I'm sorry, that's not good enough, you know. So I think it's going to be fine, like I said. I, and BlackBerry has this kind of grasp on yes. high-end enterprises and governments that I don't think, I think people underestimate. Um, and maybe that, maybe that will be their only market in a couple of years. I mean, uh, you know, And that say, may but. be the rationale that they have is we don't yeah. want to put your mail on this device mm -hmm. because yeah. we have a secure BlackBerry and you just t bridge to the BlackBerry uh, and yes. then it's safe. And, uh, and, right. So the trend in smartphones beyond BlackBerry, although certainly they've made a stab here as well, is for these very consumer-friendly devices, right, where you mix and match home and work right. on the same device. But this is interesting because it's a real separation of church and state, if you will, between two physical devices. You know, the, the playbook, despite the fact that it comes from RIM, which, again, is very big with the enterprise space and all that, has got a lot of interesting kind of entertainment stuff going on on it. And uh, I think it's a good, you know, size and weight for travel and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I wish... You know, I wish Apple would make a smaller iPad or a bigger iPad a pod touch. They, you know, they're free to go either way, I guess. You know, something, I'm sure there's a middleman size, you know, the seven inch or whatever, um, or something the size of like, say, a Kindle device uh, that would just be the ultimate in portability. And, you know, for, ga for playing games, it would be great. For watching movies, it would be great, that kind of thing. So I just think they have an ecosystem problem, basically. It is, it is uh, sprightly. It's very fast. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what you notice immediately is it just boom. It's, cause it's I talked to, yeah, so I talked to them about, you know, one of the things that's really intriguing about it is this notion of it's going to run Android apps. And we'll see how that plays mm -hmm. out. But they weren't willing to really discuss what the performance was going to be like because obviously the question is it will be full speed, right? And yeah, we'll, you know, it was, it, it was basically no comment. We, it's like, an emulator. You know, yeah. So, so maybe it won't be great. Right. Um, which could be a problem. And I think well, just, the, the very fact that they say they're going to do that is almost an admission that... I know, I know. We are not going to have well, any apps, so... God, do we really need another mobile platform? Right. You know, and this is a problem HP is going to have as well. And it's tough because when you look at WebOS, you think, this thing is really nice. But, you know, it's like, do we really need another one of these things? I mean, do we need yet another way to do this stuff? I mean, I, I don't know. You know, it, it, this is the big question. You know, how many of these platforms can survive and thrive? Uh, in the market going forward, I don't know. Yeah, I've I've I wasted five hundred bucks. I admit it. No, I wouldn't. No, no, no. I wouldn't say it like that. You know I, what? I, I, go ahead. I you wasted five hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you.
That's how I'd say it. <laughs> no, no. I, I, obviously, it's important for you to know. No, I had to do it. It's really going on with it. I had yeah. to do it. Um, well, I almost did, and I actually I kind of stayed my hand. I almost bought, when they, when they did the Kindle with the ads, and it was, a, what was it, 119? I know, I know. It's like, Leo, listen, but I have this, three Kindles in the I, house. I, I don't right, need I do, another well, one. I have two in the house, but the third being at someone else's house now. But, um, yeah, we have a problem. <laughs> I'm a Kindle addict. Help me. I know. I am too. I love these things. It's because I want, you know, I don't have the newest little one. I have, See, I have I Kindle 2s. I have three Kindle 2s. Oh, so my, my problem's even worse because I saw this ad thing and I thought to myself, it's just 115 bucks. It's so cheap. And those ads might actually be of value because, again, in the, in the sense that we discussed previously, Amazon's ecosystem and platform play. These are going to be ads for like Amazon things. Right. You know, so in other words, it, like a Groupon style deal where you, you know, buy a $30 Amazon gift certificate for $20. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't mind finding out about stuff like that. This might actually be better than having a regular Kindle. Sure, I'll get ads and a Kindle. This line of thinking is dangerous. <laughs> and What's I, wrong I, with I, us? I did the same thing you did, which is literally your hand is hovering over the mouse button like, um, yeah. So you resisted too? Yeah, I did. Whew, me too. Because I have enough uh, stuff to send to Gazelle this time around. I don't need. I don't need any more. Yeah. But I bought a Kindle for my daughter, who did not take it to college. Broke my heart. I bought a Kindle for my wife, who uses her iPad. Right. And I still have my original Kindle. So what do I need another one for? I've owned every Kindle they've ever made, although except for the DX. I've never bought one of the big ones. I although I do wonder no. about that too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, the Kindle is awesome, and I think it's the platform, you know, for ebooks. I think uh, the well, leading you've heard Jerry Pornell talk about this. I mean, he is a con convert. Oh, okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Huge that convert. Sure. Well, his daughter yeah. published a sequel um, mm -hmm. to one of his novels, uh, which, and which? I can't remember. It's uh, the Audis. Remember the Audis? It's kind of about the Audis, um, okay. and. Uh, and she's done very well. And he says because she keeps 70%, she only right. has, she sold 10000 or whatever. That's great. She made more money on that than I make, you know, myself. So now he's taking, he's like going to take all his old Chaos Manor columns and e self-publish. He convinced Dvorak to do the same thing on Twitter a couple of weeks back. Um, yeah. He's like, so this is I great. Love I love it. So the Kindle... Uh, to date has two main problems. Um, one is that you cannot lend library books yes right well this you, is one of the they, didn't they do something about that well that's so they just announced this so later this year this is coming to the kindle finally i, I would have to say that is the from a pure ebook reading standpoint that is the one major advantage that the nook has over the kindle today but now they're going to get rid of that which is great by the way the second of those two is the color screen thing and um i i do believe that for text meaning all novels and news most newspapers uh you know, just reading that the Kindle screen is actually superior than a, any color LCD, whatever. But no, I know. have an iPad. If I want color, I'll read Kindle books on the iPad. Yes, and and right, and so I th I think that just from a, it's almost like from a marketing perspective, Amazon needs a color Kindle device, and all signs are pointing to the fact that they're going to come out with one. They're going to do uh, an Android tablet is what they're going to do. They're going to do an Android tablet. So I think they'll address that second concern later in the year. But the other thing they're adding is. The ability for authors to directly publish to the Kindle platform now. Yes, and, uh, that's, what, that's what Jerry's talking about. Yes, and that's fascinating because, uh, you know, I don't know how long it's been since we talked about this, but in the context of starting up to do the Windows phone book last year, I looked out at the market for publishing because I, what, the problem with books is they, they sort of exist in space. You know, you, you, you put it out and then... Updates happen to the thing you wrote about, and there's no way to update a book. It's it's right. printed on paper, and you know it just sits there. And I really wanted Wiley to uh, adopt and embrace alternative publishing methods, which they haven't, at least not yet. But it would be neat to be able to electronically publish something, a book, a live book, you know, whatever you want to call it, and then be able to update it over time as things change. Well, that's called the web. Oh, I, I right, but I, I still no, think I agree that there's with something you. that resembles a book. You know, no, I agree with you, PDF. and yeah. I don't think they're so, far off from doing that. I think that's completely right, right. doable. So I, there's no way there's ever going to be an update to my Windows Phone book, an official update. But what I, I would like to do is my own set of small updates to the book, perhaps over time, 
where I could publish them either myself or perhaps through this Kindle thing. And uh, not, not just in an errata sense, but also, you know, things change. <laughs> Thankfully, slowly with Windows Phone. But, no, but that's an you know, issue things, as a computer book, of course. Yeah, things do change. So it would be neat as new capabilities are provided, say in these software updates or whatever, or as new software versions come out, that you could, um, you know, update your book electronically. So I'm going to look into doing that. I'm, 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 I, I, before this Kindle announcement, I was looking at other self-publishing schemes, of which there are many, including ways, by the way, in which people can... Uh, on your behalf, print copies of the book if they want a printed book, right? So right. that's kind of a nifty uh, bit of functionality as well. So I'm just kind of looking at that stuff. But you know, anyway, as far as the Kindle goes, it's, it's, it has gotten better. That's what Corey Doctorow uh, has done, which is really interesting. We, we interviewed him on Triangulation a couple of weeks ago. He has, I have one of his books with a little help. It just came out as a compilation of his short stories. And he says, if you find a typo, yeah. uh, email me, and I will give you a footnote in the next edition. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, you'll get a free book. And the footnote is in the next edition is like tomorrow because he's right. he's, he's using... Um, yeah, I mean... You know, he's sell, right. it's imagine, e uh, imagine if I found a typo in one of my win, you know, Windows Secrets books and what the process would be. We'll, we'll fix it next year. They wouldn't even fix it, I think is how it would work. Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine they would just say, yeah, that's nice. You know, this is... Not, you know, I mean, this is, I don't think there's any realistic way to fix something like that so anyway i this is neat and it's not the answer for everything but i think it's uh it's a big piece of the puzzle so um, yeah it's exciting de definitely something i'm going to look at uh portal 2 have you i have to confess mm -hmm. if you see some bags under my eyes yep i've been playing a little bit of it i love this it? game I, yeah, it's yeah, such yeah, a good yeah. game not done yet but i yeah i got i came home with a red eye and then slept on and off throughout the day but then portal 2 arrived and i was like oh god i gotta play this so i'm only about i think i'm not quite through the third part of it but you know you run into the glados machine right from the first game and the sarcasm there is so awesome and so over the top you know and i, I can't i can't replicate her voice but she says something to you right away like uh, you know so most people who are uh, deprived of sustenance like you've been are really emaciated but you somehow I've managed to put on a couple of pounds. Good for you. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, she really rips on you the whole time. It's such a funny. So God, yeah, it's funny. like, what, what have you been doing since you murdered me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I love the whole, uh, the humor of Portal 2 is beautiful. But then of course, at its heart, what it is, is a, an incredible, awesome puzzle solving game. And I remember when I saw the first demos of it, I thought it almost looks too good. You know, that uh, there was a, a graphics quality to the original portal that I thought I felt was being destroyed in a way. But now that I'm playing it, it, it just looks beautiful to me. I think it looks great. So, um, so far so good. I, like I said, I haven't finished it, but the, the bit that I've played so far, um, it's right up there. It's just, it's fantastic. I'm so happy. There's another portal. I wish they would put one of these things out every year. You know, it's great. Well, they, they could, you know, it's funny because it's not a particularly, like a big game. Sophisticated in many ways. Yeah, it was kind of an afterthought on the orange box. I know. I know. It's like this little throw-in. It's a puzzle um, game. So I'm curious, you know, Portal 2 is sold as a standalone game, and I believe it's full price. I think it's 55 or 60 bucks. So I don't know how long it is. I mean, I'm, I, in some ways, it would be sort of disappointing if it was just as long as the first one and not any bigger. But on the other hand, um, I'm just so happy there is one. I don't think I'd care. But there's a co-op mode as well. Uh, which I have not looked at at all, but I'm wondering if that isn't uh, other, either different levels or at least different achievements by doing things in different ways. You know, if you have someone playing with you, and that's kind of a cool way to update the game, right? You, know, you make it so that it's not, because, you know, Portal, I think a lot of people, I did this with my son, is you, you sit there and play it together anyway, because the puzzles are hard enough after a while that you need some help figuring out, you know, how do I put it here? Do I do this? And um, being able to play it truly cooperatively is just an awesome capability as well. Yeah, I haven't tried that yet. Now, how uh, you do that using? No, I haven't done it. It's Xbox it's Live, main. or how do you? I believe you could do it either way. So, I, like I said, I haven't tried it yet. But um, my, I'm such a loser online guessing, so. that I don't even want anybody to go, Leo. You're ruining this game. For <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're really not very good. Yeah, are you? Um, yeah, System Link or Xbox Live. So. It's yeah. it's uh, it's it's so much fun, but I'm just working my way through it. I guess Brian Brushwood uh, did a UStream where he played the whole game from beginning to end in I, yep. something like five or six hours, something like that. 
So it's not a deep game. It's a puzzle game. But boy, you're right. You don't want to eat it too fast because the you want to don't want to be jaded um, by I, the humor. When you start off, it's almost the type of thing if you could do it, if you could just sit down and just play the whole thing, you'd probably be better off, other than just from getting tired doing it. But I, I flew red eye. I don't sleep very well on a plane anyway. So Perfect for that. I was out of my mind. But I, I, you play it in the beginning. Of course, the beginning is very easy. And then you put it down and you fall asleep and you come back and then you pick it up and you're st I'm staring at this. It took me five minutes to understand what I was even supposed to do. I'm, you know, after what, you know, after you get the real gun where you can have the two different kinds of portals and yeah. it's this complete, you know, complex, uh, humongous room. I think I just stared at the screen for five minutes thinking like, I, I don't even, what is this? <laughs> you know, I know it took a while, you know, you were groggy. It, yeah. It's awesome. That's okay. It's a, it's a, and then you just let Gladys talk. Yeah, I love that stuff. It's worth it just, just to be. Great. You want to finish it just so she can rag on you again. You know. Hey, she we says, got you flying through the air like an eagle, <laughs> an eagle flying a blimp. <laughs> you know, it's good. It is. It is so good. Um, Windows, of course, a Mac too, because of Steam. Thank you, Steam. Yep. yep. Uh, yep. PlayStation Three, Xbox Three Sixty. And, you know, it would be a great uh, phone game, too. Maybe they'll do a Windows phone version. I actually wondered why there wasn't already yeah. a phone version. I think that this Maybe the left type of right game, now. I think it would lend itself very well to a screen, uh, to a touch screen, Maybe actually. You just go zzz, zzz. Why not? Maybe you double tap for orange and single tap for blue. Or... Yeah. Hey, speaking of Windows Phone 7, a new version of Dimitri's um, Twit program. We're very happy. Dimitri's just rocking it, crushing it. Are there, uh, you know, I should ask, I mean, are there apps like this on other platforms? Because Nothing it seems like yes. this should be. Yes, we oh, have, uh, but there, none of them are done by us. Um, we right. have a partner, Mediafly, that does Someone it. Someone should work with app. Dimitri to kind of port this app to other platforms. It's so awesome. But we got a, Craig Mullaney of Shift Key Software does our iPhone uh, version, and we have a, a developer doing an Android version. But I think that the king of the hill right now is this uh, yeah. for uh, Windows Phone. 1.5 just came great. out. Yeah, so this version has ads, which I you know, may not sound That's like fine. a I don't mind uh, like a you know like a reason to upgrade, but um, he's working toward a system where he can have a, a paid version as well. Yeah, uh, and I, you should just support the guy. I mean, he's such a, a great programmer and a good guy, and um, you know he's supporting Windows Phone, which is uh, certainly its own uh, Sisyphean task in its own right. So if you if you haven't seen this though, uh, definitely check it out. You know, obviously if you have Windows Phone. And um, I think you'd just be really impressed by it. this. is such a, a great Windows Phone app. He you know, says, takes and, and I understand this completely. He didn't want to put ads in, but uh, the donations, he was hoping to do it kind of donation where. Well, they don't, uh, probably don't support they it. They don't support it. And this has been my experience too. We, we were going to be a donation where network, but we would never have mm -hmm. been able to grow to the size that we've grown and have the variety and quality of content that we have uh, if it weren't for advertisers. So I completely understand that. He, will, he says he wants to go to a paid version. Mm -hmm. uh, as you say, to um, eventually uh, give people an ad-free experience as well. But I don't think the ads are annoying. He's using the Microsoft ad platform. I think it's fine. And yep. it's free. you got to love that. And it's awesome. I think it's that's awesome. Big... And I thank you, Dimitri, for uh, yep. what you've done. I think it's great. Hey, let's take a break. We've got our tip of the week and some software to recommend. And more, of course, Paul Therott is here talking about Windows. Windows, 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 Microsoft, 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 all that stuff. But, of course... <laughs> <laughs> and other stuff. Are they going to do, have they said anything about an Audible app yet for Windows Phone 7? I hear conflicting stories here. I, I will tell people this. Um, the way Audible is going to have to happen on Windows Phone is through an app. You know, that's the way they do this now. It's the right way to do it. If you've ever seen the, the Android Audible or app the iPhone on app, uh, iPhone incredible. or Android, is it, excellent. And the way it was handled in the past, in case you're not familiar, is that, Am or, uh, yeah, well, actually it is Amazon, but Audible would have to create or get drivers and then support it through their own terrible software. Well, the way, the, the way they were hoping to do it until recently, yeah. I think, was that third parties would develop it with help. So when somebody created a device, yeah. uh, Audible would, come, would go to them and say, look, here's the SDK, here's everything you need to know, but right. could, could you please write an app for it? And I think sure. now there's enough dominant platforms they, they can say, okay, well, we'll support these key platforms. Yeah, and you know, before there was a dedicated app, the Audible had this system where you, they could blast the stuff over to iTunes because you know Apple supported that natively. Right. Uh, Apple does a much better job with that stuff of that with that stuff than other people. But um, no, I mean the way it works now is there has to be an app. You know, that you're not going to see Windows Mobile. I'm sorry, Windows Phone support 
drivers for the Audible app, whatever that's called. I can't even remember what it's called anymore. It's just the uh, Audible app. <laughs> well, Audible. the Audible, I mean the Audible app on Windows. You know, so in oh. other words, you, what, what Microsoft and maybe Audible call sideloading. You know, you'd run this no, 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 no. third-party app. Even, so, even though I have that capability on the iPhone, I still use the Audible app. Of course, of course. It's just, it's just the way to do it. You could download because it directly you could be out the in the world and, and finish yeah. a book and then say, now I want another yeah. one. You don't have to tether it. Your library is computer, on, it, yeah. Yeah, on here. So unfortunately, uh, no, it's not, this is not something you're going to see in a Windows Phone software update or whatever. This is going to have to come through. Uh, through Audible, so I'm a big uh, fan. conflicting, conflicting stories. Well, there, I hope but. they do. I mean, uh, I, one of the things I really love about uh, Audible is uh, these Audible apps, and they yep. have, and now they have badges too. You can get, you know, you get like your stats of how you've listened. I, this is a brand new phone, so I don't have any. I'm a newbie. Mm -hmm. I'm an app newbie. <laughs> app newbie. One. Nice. But you can work your way up to app master. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's just fun. You know, it just makes like it a, fun. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. But I have to say, this is really, and they have a little widget for uh, on Android. You get a widget, which is great, that you can play mm -hmm. directly from the home screen. If I start playing now, uh, let's see, not download that one because this is where I am. I'll start playing now. Um, so the thing, the thing that's so cool about Audible is they have over seventy thousand books. Isn't that nice? It's right on the home screen. So I see now what I'm playing. Look, I admit it's not the Metro user interface, but it's hey. No, it's not. No, it's not. Is it? No. Audible.com. Slash Windows. You can try Audible for yourself. Plays on almost all devices, including the Kindle, many GPS devices, 70,000 books, kind of an unlimited supply of great literature. Well, I shouldn't say literature because, as, as Paul often points out, it's not just fiction. There's a lot of great nonfiction. Uh, there's sci fi, of course, but there's also history. There's classic books, but there are also business books. In fact, really, it's, it's, it's a bookstore, it's everything you'd ever want. I you always know. check Audible <clears throat> first because that's my preferred way to listen, to it read. It occurs to me I never even checked to see if in the Plex was in there. Uh, I believe it is. It is. Yeah, look at that. Well, maybe I should recommend that one instead. No, you recommend whatever you want. I just, <laughs> well, no, I like the idea of that. Let me just make sure. Yeah, uh, Stephen Levy, narrated by L.J. Ganser. It is 19 hours and 45 minutes. That's a long book, which is nice. I like to, personally, I like to listen to long books because, well, it depends. You might want to consider how much time you're going to get in the car, commuting, or yeah. at the gym yeah, on the treadmill. Yeah, let's, let's go with that one. I, I, that's, like I said, it, I really like the way it's structured. And because it doesn't require you to have an understanding of the full history to, re, you know, to be at any one part of it, you can go in and out of it pretty easily because it's, it's really... Uh, segmented nicely, and I think it would lend itself well to an audiobook. Yeah, I, I agree. I've listened that's to a good uh, one. That's a good. That's a good industry choice right there. A number of other Stephen uh, Levy books on Audible, and it is a great way to read. And five stars, by the way. Uh, so you're not alone. A lot of people love this book. Actually, you know, Idea Man's in there too. <laughs> of course, it is. I say I didn't think. I didn't realize these things happen so quickly. Now they now they're doing it day and date. So when uh, in, publishers finally realized, oh. You mean there's a market for audiobooks? Yeah, boy. Okay. So uh, now publishers are making sure that that audiobook gets into uh, the bookstore uh, at the same time as the book gets into the bookstore, and uh, Audible really benefits from that. I, that, like I said, when I hear about a book, yeah, you know, I go to Audible first and I download it because that's how I like to listen. I listen in the car, at the gym. I listen when I'm doing the dishes. I've got it now working through my Sonos because Sonos has AirPlay, so I can play it right off my iPhone into my Sonos speaker system, so I can listen all over the house while I vacuum. I don't vacuum. But if I were to vacuum, <laughs> Jeez. in case right. my wife's listening, she says, oh, yeah, vacuum. Right, Leo? Yeah, you vacuum. You suck. Uh, it, no, she doesn't say that. We just celebrated our 20th, <laughs> our 20th anniversary. Yesterday. Uh, it's the China yeah. anniversary, you know, so... I'm going to give her a you trip going to, China. to China. Oh, wait, not that kind of China. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that or a trip to the porcelain, uh, and I didn't think that was right. Go to audible.com, make a trip, and uh, I didn't mention this, but you fly a lot, and I do too, and listening on a plane, just, you know, no baby crying, no uh, long stewardess announcements about why you should buy duty-free goods on the plane. Okay. <laughs> you just can enjoy the trip audible.com slash windows your first one's free you'll sign up for the gold account that's the book a month subscription that's kind of the easiest way to get started with audible and uh, your first month's free your first book's free and you keep it even if you cancel at any time audible.com slash windows give it a try today we know since paul and i are major audible lovers that you will love it too 
Yeah, well, I think that I think that either one of those would be good. That's again part of the problem is there's so many books uh, on Audible that you want to listen to. It's hard to pick just one. I, uh, you know, both. Of, it's funny. Both those books would be a good choice uh, for an audio book. Yeah, actually. yeah. Completely agree. That's good. I, I've gotten some questions lately from people who are interested in industry type books, and like I said, there really hadn't been any good ones for a while. But those right. are both very good choices. Ones. Despite the strange error in fact, in <laughs> you see how picky I can be. But I mean, well, but Netscape, is, no, you, no. Listen, you know how it is. So, I I worked in banking, for example, for several years. So when I watch a movie where a bank gets robbed, I can. I can see like uh, vaults don't work like that, and that you've just ruined the movie for That's me. That's a good point. You know, so when you know too much about anything, it's bad. Uh, yeah, I, uh, right. So you're such a better media consumer if you're dumb and ignorant. <laughs> well, by the way, I think. absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> like they they rely on that, Leo. <laughs> it's yeah. actually uh, the the whole decline in the educational system in the United States is a conspiracy <laughs> by HBO. I've to been working to make myself stupider, but. <laughs> Hey, our Windows Weekly Tip of the Week. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks to uh, Leo Zaman and actually a couple of other people since then who have mentioned that Microsoft now offers a free uh, safety scanner yes, for we download. we talked about it on Security Now. You did. So this, this one's interesting because it's a, it's, a, it's a downloadable, standalone security scanner. It's not real-time protection like you would get from an antivirus or anti-malware solution. But the reason I think this is, and, and by the way, it expires every 10 days, so... Uh, I'm curious. I just got it, so I don't know what happens if you run it after 10 days. But that's one thing I'm going to be looking at. Because Probably I'm make sure you download the new one. That's what I'm saying. I'm hoping it just does that. Yeah. Um, but the reason you want this is no matter what you're using for uh, security on your computer right now, uh, it's always good to have another one, right? So for those people who uh, already want to do this, and then for those who don't, you should. Um, it's really important occasionally uh, just to run a manual scan on your computer and see what's on there in different Solutions have different, uh, you know, signature files and so forth and different capabilities. And I think this is just another little tool you can throw in your tool belt. Um, yeah, even if you have security so, essentials, this is kind of a separate yeah. thing that you should have. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Even so if it's you have uh, MRT, right? This yeah. is not MRT. This is something a little bit more advanced. Right. So definitely check. It just, it's a free, simple little download. Just go grab it. And uh, if anything goes wrong or you're thinking something might be going wrong, uh, this will be there for you to uh, to run against that and see it. Make sure your PC is okay. And I have to agree with you on your Windows 7 app pick. Yeah, I mean, we've discussed this one before, but I've been thinking a lot lately, of course, about this cross-platform stuff with regards to devices, you know, Android devices, iPads, and so forth. Um, this doesn't work in that vein, but I move between a lot of computers, and I think a lot of people do too. You know, you have a desktop computer and a laptop or a couple of different laptops or a work machine and a home machine and so forth. And... You know, one of the most uh, time-consuming and ponderous things to do is to sit down at a computer and, A, reinstall apps, or, B, reconfigure all those websites you've already signed up for, and you might have forgot, if you were smart, you have different passwords for, and you forgot them all, and all that kind of stuff. So, LastPass is a no-brainer. It's kind of a classic. But as I move from computer to computer, and I move from browser to browser, um, this is that thing that stores all of my passwords, and it's just awesome. And, of course, it generates uh, long-form, complex passwords for you, uh, it's the one thing uh, that I do. You know, I, sh I should probably just write this down sometime, but there, there are a number of steps that I go through every time when I reinstall Windows or get a new computer. And one of the very first things I do after I get the browsers I want going is just install LastPass. And I do that before I go to any websites because I want it just to log me on, you know. And uh, in tandem with that, I'll just throw out a, a small tip, obviously, <laughs> but uh, you should be logging on to your computer too, by the way, because when, you know, that should be the level of defense and should auto-log you off after a certain amount of time. And then you're, you can have your websites uh, protected with LastPass. So it's a huge, huge, huge thing. Uh, That's what I use. Yeah. Highly awesome. recommend it. Awesome. And it's free, but uh, I, get the, I want to support them, so I give them the buck a month pro. I, yeah, so what I'm hoping for LastPass Pro, or whatever they call the paid version, is that over time... These mobile browsers like Safari on the iPhone and iPad and then whatever Android has and so forth uh, get more sophisticated and then support a plug-in model. You know, I think the way that it works, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think on the iPad and iPod Touch and then uh, the iPhone rather, um, they actually have an alternate browser that's part of the LastPass download that you get. So it's running the browser in the background, but it's their own browser because right. that way they can you know plug into their own stuff. And that's okay, but what I'd really like to see is the ability to install 
a LastPass plugin on the mobile browsers, just like you can on the desktop browsers, yeah. and then you'll have that you know that full solution. I think it's a little tricky. There is a, an Android browser Dolphin that has a LastPass plugin. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a little, it just depends on the. Yeah, right. But I, I, I think uh, Google and Apple and Microsoft, you know, whoever makes these platforms, they need to support this functionality in the I browsers. Agree. And it, then, be, then you have a first class experience, yeah, obviously. I agree. Uh, let's just move on, shall we? <laughs> yes, to we shall. Windows 7, Windows Phone 7. Yeah, I was hoping to have something a little more substantial this week. I, I obviously. Um, well, you can't go Windows. wrong with Super Monkey Ball. <laughs> Well, Windows Phone is tough because, you know, again, it's the new platform. So a lot of this stuff is uh, apps, you know, from other platforms. I actually looked at a couple of Windows, Mo uh, Windows Phone specific apps this week. I just couldn't bring myself to, uh, to recommend them. So um, Super Monkey Ball is an awesome game. It's only been around for about 200 years. But if you have a Windows Phone and you don't have it, it's a great game. It's $5. But if you don't want to spend that much, uh, Microsoft is starting to publish a bunch of the classic Atari games also to Windows Phone. And uh, the first two are out now, Centipede and Asteroids. Um, and th those are decent mobile, you know, touchscreen choices, I guess. I'm not sure about other games. We'll have to wait and see. But those, those are actually decent. I do have both of those. Uh, and those are, are available for two ninety nine. So you can get your mobile gaming on or whatever. <laughs> get your monkey ball on. <laughs> exactly. Uh Actually, in terms of mobile apps, there are a couple of kind of cross-platform apps you have recommended. Yeah, so these are non-Windows Phone. Um, I'm looking into like... Uh, There's no Evernote on Windows Phone? I don't believe so yet. You no. can use the browser interface, I'm sure, to Evernote. So you can still access the notes. Yeah, so, but this, this pick is specifically for non-Windows Phone anyway, so it doesn't really matter. I, my contention here is that a lot of people have Windows on the desktop, but they're going to use an iPad or an Android phone or whatever. And... and how can we move back and forth between these things in a way that makes Evernote. sense? So mm. uh, if you're at a purely, uh, I would just say from a note-taking standpoint, and um, when Microsoft came out with OneNote several years back, I, it was like they invented this app for me because obviously I'm a journalist. I take right. lots of notes. Uh, note-taking app is awesome. But note-taking is not just for people like me. It's also for students, but it's also for anyone who, um, you know, needs to jot down ideas or capture some information from a website or whatever it is, but then wants to use it in different places. So if you're in a purely Microsoft kind of a world or a Windows world where you have a Windows desktop PC, a Windows laptop um, or tablet or whatever, you know, OneNote's great. It's awesome. It's very full featured. It's mature. It's a great app. And now in Office 2010, it's part of every suite, right? Whereas before you had to buy a special version of the suite or buy it separately. Um, now it's in all the mainstream versions of the suite. So I think it's going to become a, a much bigger deal. Than it and it's, on, it's kind of on Windows Phone 7. So, it is on Windows Phone 7, right, exactly. So that there's your Windows Phone 7 comes sort of it. option. Yeah, it does come with it. And there's some sync stuff there that's really kind of interesting. Um, it, it, OneNote is part of, uh, uh, well, part of SharePoint Online. It's part of uh, Office 365. So you can, you, you, can, you can put OneNote notebooks up in SharePoint, for example, and share them uh, between different users and so forth. It works on the web through OneNote web app. So if you, you can even use it on a Mac through a web browser if you wanted to. So... There's some interesting collaboration choices there. But for true cross-platform support, I mean, Evernote's the king, right? I mean, uh, Evernote is it. In fact, Evernote is on so many different things, it's almost ludicrous. I mean, you can get Evernote on everything. It's really kind of neat. Just, it's just great because you put it it's in awesome, one yeah. database and, and it goes right. to all of the rest. It syncs up. It's Yeah, and it really kind of blows OneNote away in that regard. I mean, it's interesting. So OneNote has a nicer UI. Yeah, but I mean, uh, but again, if, if your goal is to, for it to be everywhere and you right. don't use a Windows-based mobile device, right. I mean, Evernote's pretty much it, right? So there's a native client for the Mac and the PC uh, and a client for the iPad and iPod and I think for Android as well. Yeah, I'm there's sure a web Android client. Yeah. There's also web uh, add-ins, right, that let you easily grab stuff from a web page and mm -hmm. push it into an Evernote-based uh, notebook and so forth. So... Um, Evernote's free. There's a paid version as well that has additional capabilities and additional uh, capabilities around uploading, you know, amounts, so forth, and all that kind of stuff. But um, it, it's just, it's kind of a no-brainer. Again, if, if you use a Windows PC or a Mac and some other thing that's not a Windows PC, <laughs> Evernote's the one to get. I mean, it's just, it's just on everything. It's amazing. And once, I think once you look into it, if you, if you have a need for this kind of thing, uh, you'll be blown away by it. And, and and by the way, this is a silly, silly example, but it's not even necessarily a highly technical thing. You can make a shopping list in Evernote uh, at your PC and then go to the store and open up Evernote in your Android phone or your iPhone 
and the list is there. I mean, and again, I'm, 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 this is not high tech, you know, it's like an IBM ad for the PS1 or something, but I mean, it's or the PC Junior, but um, that's actually, it's, it's cooler than I'm making it sound. I mean, the ability to get at this stuff from anywhere is really, really kind of neat. So uh, definitely check out Evernote. And uh, if you like Microsoft, definitely check out this podcast. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> because it's done now. And you could go back and listen to it. If you've just joined us, you missed it. Uh, Windows Weekly is actually uh, every uh, Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv with our great host, Paul Thurat, and our great fund friend, uh, Paul is uh, the guy in charge at the super site for windows and frankly if you missed it you could just go to the super site for windows and you could find most of the content there he's very good about putting mm -hmm. a bunch of good stuff up almost every single day yeah i'll put uh my macbook air stuff i'm going to put the first part up today and then over the week i think probably through the weekend i'm going to experiment with different ways of getting windows onto this particular machine and then I'll have a write-up about that experience after that. This is what I... You're kind of the quintessential blogger, but you've been doing it for longer than, than most people, and that's what I like about it is that you kind of... You sit there in your little blog cave, and... <laughs> it and, is a little blog cave. And you think of things to do, and then you write about them. Yep. And if you're... I mean, basically, Paul is one of us. And if you want... <laughs> yeah, you know, okay. you want to know about stuff, uh, Office 365, putting Windows on an Apple, uh, you know, uh, Windows Home Server. This is a great site for that. Um, highly recommended. It. It's called the Super Site for Windows or Paul Therott's Super Site for Windows at winsupersite.com. He also is a news editor for Windows IT Pro, the author of many great Windows Secrets books, including Windows 7 Secrets and the brand new Windows Phone Secrets. And uh, as I said, every Thursday we do this show, and you can catch it. If you don't want to watch it live or you can't catch it live, and I know some of you actually have day jobs, <laughs> which make that difficult. Paul, I you? don't. But uh, if you do, uh, what you do is you go to iTunes or the Zoom Marketplace or anywhere finer podcasts are archived and retrieved, and you can get a copy of this. You know, the easiest way to go to twit.tv slash WW for Windows Weekly, and we've got you know links to all the different sources for you. Uh, even audio, if you don't want to see us, as well as video. I, which I recommend highly. Highly. This is not yeah. what I would call a visual podcast. <laughs> right. It's not like a spring break special on MTV. It's no, kind of no. the opposite of that. No, you won't see us in Speedos leaping around. <laughs> unless, Spraying well. Spraying water on each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Giddily. Yeah, but, but the nice thing about doing the audio version is you can close your eyes and imagine that. Yes, I just was. Yeah, I kind of got a vivid image. I really wish I could put some days. <laughs> you get that little Borat suit, don't you? <laughs> Thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time on Windows Week. Bye-bye.